All right, everyone, welcome, welcome. It's good to have everyone here. It's Tuesday, March 14th, 2023, <laughs> and we're here for the monthly work session of the athens Clark County Mayor and Commission here in City Hall. Uh, we have six items on the agenda tonight. Uh, some of these are for more immediate action, uh, and a couple of them have implications for our coming budget year and years beyond. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Manager Williams so he can introduce the first project. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so we've got uh, six items tonight. The first three involve SPLOS or T-SPLOS projects, moving them along. And on the first one, with regard to Memorial Park improvements, we've got Diana Jackson, uh, SPLOS Project Administrator. Hold on. All right, um, so good evening. Hope you all are doing well. Um, tonight, Eric Hammerland and I have the pleasure of revisiting the November work session presentation um, of the proposed project concepts for the SPLOS 2020 Project 16 Memorial Park improvements. So there's a lot to cover um, in our short amount of time. So what i really like to do is kind of go through what didn't change from um, the work session rather quickly. So you'll see um, in these slides on the upper right hand side of them, you'll see a bright yellow box and it'll say like this didn't change from the November work session and hopefully that helps you. Um, I know that there's some new people here um, with Commissioner Fisher and Culpepper, but um, is, so just bear with me, okay? Um, all right, so our agenda and purpose again is to present um, the user group's proposed project concept. Um, we'll go through some of the history and we'll talk through some of the public engagement and um, yeah, the concepts themselves. Again, our user group had three residents and uh, four staff members. Excuse me, no worries, hey. Um, the, their, uh, the charge and the initial project statement also has not changed. Um, the, again, they were gonna review the previous studies, develop a recommended project list, and, and carry the, those um, projects into the concept planning phase. And again, as a refresher, as we go through this, remember that the Bear Hollow Zoo is its own SPLOS 2020 project. Um, the next five slides are the history or excuse me, seven slides, sorry. It, that was what's changed. We added a few more history items in there. Um, so you'll see um, that a few of them have been added. Um, again, they're all on your packet, not really gonna go through them all. One big one is that in May of 2018, the master plan was approved by the mayor and commission. And again, we added in, so you can go look at that if you want to. Um, a couple other things that were added in was um, what the initial requests were and what we ended up getting um, as far as the budget um, that the voters approved. Um, um, yes, so then getting to here, we went through, the user group went through the master plan and some of the other past studies and they amassed 55 recommendations and they sorted those, distilled them four categories. Um, those categories are four bay and pond improvements, pedestrian circulation and safety improvements, vehicular circulation and parking improvements, and playground and picnic shelter improvements. Um, so then their final uh, was 17 projects that they tiered. Um, we took those 17 projects out for public engagement in June and July of 22, and with the assistance of staff, we had both online story map and survey, as well as in-person community engagements. Um, staff and the user group reached out to our community partners, PIO office assisted with social media and other tactile messaging. Um, we had 115 respondents with 450 written comments. Those will be all as uh, an attachment to your agenda item. Um, so um, leisure services staff compiled those um, comments into um, basically the must-haves, highly wanted, nice-to-haves, and unnecessary. Uh, that's the voting, so the blues, the must-haves, the orange, highly wanted, gray, nice-to-have, gold, uh, unnecessary. Um, so in this next slide, we then, sorry, um, ranked them um, again 
the user group ranked them and the public engagement we ranked them um, again um, the user group they did take into account the public scoring and comments into consideration when they developed their own scoring um, this is the cost estimate associated with each one of the projects as I described before um, it uses recent pricing from some of the other county projects but it's an estimated as standalone projects and again, why is that important to point out? It shows that if projects are combined into, like, say, a single construction project, there'll be cost efficiencies. Um, so if, like, the four bay or the pond or revamped or improved, there'll be drive improvements and restoration required because we're going to haul out. But um, there'll be overlap with construction methodologies there. And um, so just wanted to point that out that when we start combining things into a larger project, there'll be efficiencies of costs. So what you have in front of you is the user group's tiered list of the 17 projects. And what was different from the last time was we actually put them in their priority order rather than alphabetical order. Um, and so it's important to note that these 15 projects, again, came from that larger list of 55 recommendations. So just because a project is listed, as nice to have or highly wanted, it doesn't mean that it's it's still considered essential to the park's master plan or its visioning plan. Um, in a minute, I'm going to turn it over to Eric, um, but I wanted to point out one thing. You'll see that the loop there, we've got that crossed out. Um, when we met last time in November, uh, y'all requested us to go back um, to look at reducing the potential for pedestrian and vehicular conflicts by eliminating the southern half of the loop drive in favor of a two-way roundabout, you know, two-way road with a cul-de-sac at the end. We investigated that conversion and it is feasible, okay? But what we want to do is we want to have a chance to look at it, you know, in deeper while we're going from concept to schematic because when you do these types of changes, there's a lot of ripple effect things with stormwater and ADA access and pedestrian access. And also the future phases of the, of the overall park master plan. So we don't want to do something now only to have to undo it later. Okay, so we want to be able to look at it. Just want to let you know that it's feasible. And what we're doing is when we're moving this forward, is we're going to take the word loop out. So that means that we'll be looking at lots of different ways to achieve what you want us to achieve. Um, and we'll evaluate and present those to the public, uh, along with design alternatives and things like that, f as we progress from concept to schematic. I hope that makes sense, OK? Um, yeah. Yes? Um, I, and I, I know everybody probably knows this but me. But when I was looking at this at home, could you explain to me, and I kept reading, I didn't understand what the lettering meant when I looked okay, at it at home. So F is, so we put it into four categories. Okay. And the F stands for four bay and pond improvements. All v is a vehicular improvement. P okay. is a pedestrian improvement. And PS is a playground and like picnic shelter okay. improvement. Okay. That's okay. a good question. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So I guess um, with that, Eric, I'm going to turn it over to you. And you can talk about the must haves. Good evening. So, yes. Yeah, so I'm going to just go through the must-have projects and just try to give you a little background on what each of those projects includes. Um, keep in mind, as Diana said, this is very conceptual. So we have not put pen to paper. We have not started drawing the improvements. We simply, simply conceptualized what the project goal was and what those improvements might look like, and we associated order of magnitude cost to those improvements. And I apologize, I'm in that phase of life where I can't see up close or far away anymore, all at the same time. So uh, Project F1, um, this was the most important one, and this is the four bay improvements. If you go down into the park and you see a heavily vegetated area up above the ponds, that is supposed to be a four bay that collects silt and sediment before it enters, enters into the pond. So, that has been silted in and sedimented in over the years. It's now heavily vegetated, um, but Project F1 would go in there and remove all that silt and sediment, 
it would restore the pond, the four bay, back to the original geometry so it can again start collecting sediment at it, as it was originally designed. Um, this project would also include a reconstruction of the, of the little stone spillway that's at the outlet of the four bay. And it would also um, stabilize the outfall immediately downstream of the spillway, including the, uh, the pedestrian bridge. P3 um, is an isolated small project. This would, uh, this would add pedestrian crossing to the parking lot. So we would have a better protected, a safer crossing to get folks back and forth from the pool area over to the operations building and the basketball courts. So it might look like a raised crosswalk of some sort. It might have signage, um, pavement markings, just something to, to um, distinguish that that's a crossing. Right now there, there are no facilities out there. So um, that's a smaller project and it would be, as you can see, located right across from the pool. Project V1, uh, and this is the one that Diana mentioned. We kind of went back and took a, uh, a look at as far as identifying what the goal was. So when we take this um, alternative into schematic design, we'll look at how we can improve both pedestrian and vehicular movements and make sure that we're mitigating how many times those, those movements interact. Um, we'll also address the, uh, the drainage and the erosion that you can see along the, the entrance roads, um, as well as optimizing parking um, down, along, um, down along the ponds and also parking associated with picnic shelter number one. Project V3 is, um, is actually a piece of V1. So if we did not do the entirety of V1, V3 would look at optimizing the parking along the pond. It would also improve the access, add sidewalks. Right now there are no sidewalks along a lot of that parking, so you get out of your car and you don't have really anywhere to go. Um, so again, V3 would, would focus mainly just on the southern end um, along the pond. V2. Um, and, and this is also a project that would include the previously discussed um, pedestrian crossing. V2 would look at the entire parking lot um, up near the pool and the operations building in the theater area. So it, at a minimum, it would include resurfacing the parking lot and trying to optimize the parking spaces, but also adding in sidewalks and improving drainage. PS3. Um, that is primarily uh, amenities, uh, park benches, tables, um, trash receptacles, and uh, recycling bins and, that, and things of that nature. So not a lot of site work associated with those, but simply upgrading the, the amenities and replacing the older amenities. <coughs> and F2. So when you go down to the pond, the first thing you see is that upper pond is very silted in. There's really almost no water left in it at all. So F2 would focus primarily on dredging that out, reestablishing the pond to the, the way it's supposed to be. And because of the nature of that dredging work, there would be damage to the surrounding sidewalks and the retaining walls and the fences. So reconstructing, um, reestablishing, um, that infrastructure after the dredging is completed. F3 are improvements to the lower main pond. And there what we've noticed is the, uh, the outlet structure um, likely needs to be reconstructed and there is a lot of erosion. Um, there's an emergency spillway on the very southern end um, and if you happen to take a little walk off the path and down into the woods, you can see a pretty dangerous looking ravine where that has eroded. So when the pond fills up and the outlet structure no longer can flow, the water runs around, it goes over the path, and then it has created this, um, this little ravine. You can see it in the, the bottom I thought there was a left. The whole time. It's a pretty neat place to play if you're <laughs> under 14-ish. <laughs> dangerous for us. 
and V4. Um, so this we'll actually look at as part of the other alternative where we're looking at vehicle and pedestrian access. But if we were to just look at this one picnic shelter area, um, we would like to optimize our parking, create some ADA parking. And you can see if you try to get from the parking to the picnic shelter, um, there's barriers there. We would improve ADA access. So um, this would be focused on just improving the parking and pedestrian access around the picnic shelter. And that was it for the must-haves. All right. So get back up here so you can hear me. Um, so again, the budget for this project is just shy of $5.8 million. Um, and of that, 4.7 ish is ready for uh, construction and contingency. And I put this back up again, so it's just a repeat of slide 17, um, just again to show you that these, this again is the tiered <coughs> list of the 17 projects. And your next step is consideration of uh, this list at your April regular session. If you vote to approve this list, um, the user group will begin progressing the must-haves to schematic design. And it's likely that, again, their total will exceed the budget again. But we'll work to develop some alternatives that will be brought back to you in 2023 for schematic design approval. With that, I'd like to open it up. Thank you for your time. And if you have any questions. A couple of questions, Mike. Sure. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the presentation. And it, it, uh, it, um, I know there's a lot of work still yet to be that yet to go, but I, I do like the direction you're heading in. And this wasn't part of the scope, so this is probably more of a, of, of a comment or question for Manager Williams. But uh, when we're talking about the pedestrian access within the park, uh, you know, this is one of the parks that we have that there's not pedestrian access to the parks, uh, specifically a sidewalk on Grand Ellen from Millage to Grand Ellen, and uh, and I know that's a lot of neighbors around there when Commissioner Wright. Uh, we'll, we'll attest to this. I've been asking for that, and it, we kind of need to develop a safe routes to parks program. But um, and and the last time I checked, um, Manager Williams, this uh, a few months ago, the last estimate for putting a park in there was about six hundred thousand dollars, and that was probably a year or two ago. So, is there a way where we can get just a rough estimate about that? Not, not tonight, but just so that. When budget time comes around, if we can have a discussion, uh, or where we can find some, if it is six hundred thousand still, how we can how we can make that happen, and I say all that to say this, y'all, because if you look at our splice programming, I mean we're about to invest between this park and Bear Hollow eleven million dollars into into the facilities there, and that's uh, and we want them to be utilized, and we want people to have access to them, and if you go along Grand Ellen, any 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 part of. Uh, the summer day and, and after school, you'll see kids walking in the street and, and families walking in the street over there on the weekend. So, so if there's ever was a need for a sidewalk, it'd be, it'd be Grand Ellen. And do you mean, excuse me, do you mean from the millage side? From the millage side to, okay. to, I mean, to the park. One of the things we talked about, because I heard you, yeah. is that we would extend, for this project, we could extend the sidewalk to the extent of the park. Right. Yeah. Um, and get that part done with this. Yeah, project. I saw that, and I was okay. looking for for the connectivity to right. to Millage from where from where y'all are looking at okay. doing that. So maybe maybe you can figure out a way to help us with that. Yeah, we can we can give you a cost estimate for outside the park for the sidewalk. Yeah. And I know that's what you're asking. And, yeah, and maybe 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 looking at how we can utilize some uh, some of the pedestrian um, uh, T splice funds or something like that to help us meet this this need and priority. If that helps. But, but I guess I need to know how much it calls first. So thank you. Um, yes, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad to see this back. Um, this was in my district for the last ten years, and um, I'm not sure Mike's up to speed. But I'll see if I can help him learn, which he already picked up on getting people safely there. But when you go from the entrance of Memorial Park downhill, as if you were, to, to, you know, for, for people who are going to South Lumpkin, that ravine issue is there on the side of the roads as well as far as the stormwater runoff which leaves no room for anybody to walk um so routing them safely from grand ellen which is where the wayward signs are coming off a of millage into um but um I, I guess can you go back one slide to the proposed project con that list um can you send us a copy of this that shows what 
has changed since this slide doesn't have the not changed part of it right just so, let us know because I felt like some of the work session feedback there were I mean like it says some commissioner said but you know we're supposed to make changes based on the majority of the Commission so I just wanted to make sure that the improvements are a tweak versus some things that I heard were that were a very elaborate change which I wasn't sure the majority wanted so all we did was we just put instead of being in and I can yes I can give you what you okay. want but what really changed was we just put them in in the order that they were um, they were voted on by the user group okay um, versus before it was like F1 F2 F3 and we just put them in okay. we put them put in them a in ca categorical order rather than probably better to have them in the tiered order so then the main change would be uh, v1 drive improvements being different from feedback yes that was okay. the only one I mean we because you wanted us to look at something and see if it was feasible we did and we thought well if if you want us to truly look at everything as far for for getting pedestrians around and down to the pond we should take the word loop out because it may not be a loop okay so that as as the concept develops mm -hmm. it gives you more flexibility it gives us more flexibility with it still being bus accessible because mm -hmm. the ter terrain again no not everybody can walk down to that amenity right and we need the vehicular we need it safe for everybody right as, so, as so yes so when we looked at it the cul-de-sac at the bottom we could get and correct me if I'm wrong we could get a, a bus around that mm -hmm. the turnaround Cor correct yeah uh, buses and long um, maintenance vehicles yeah. need to get down there um, lots of oversized vehicles apparently you have to get down there so whatever alternatives we do move forward with whether it's a one-way loop or two-way drive or whatever we call it we'll make sure that all of those vehicles can get down around there fully and turn around fire engines <coughs> exactly. emergency vehicles um, right. what's important is that we give them all equal opportunity to, to look at those mm -hmm. and compare where the vehicles and pedestrians are Understood are meeting yeah. on both of those alternatives okay right. so. and, and I appreciate it being it's just opening up the flexibility because mm -hmm. with the um, love to death um, traffic that's over there it's not gonna be just one bus so we also need to make sure that there isn't a traffic jam with a, right. with a loop versus the drive around but that's all wide open to be discovered yeah. as you go further right right Correct. okay perfect John so a large part of this project is the pond itself and looking back at the history we uh, dredged it in 2014 the dam failed in 2018 what what can we do so we're not having to do this in another nine years Can't do you want to handle that or I mean yeah, the floor base all we worked on previously um, not the entire Pond. We didn't dredge the whole pond. So this we're not dredging the pond then, in this. The the pond revamp F two would include dredging the pond. Okay. And so would yeah. Then the four bay would be dredging the four bay, and the F two would be the pond. And the four bay is what set what's catching the sediment before it gets into the pond. Mm -hmm. And it and the and pond there, filled in with sediment before the four bay was created. Okay. So the four bay acts like it should but the legacy sediment that's in the pond has got to be dealt with so I think that that's, that's so we shouldn't have this problem again I mean we should be you're, calming you're, down the sediment getting into the pond that's correct but the four bay will have to be because that's its job is to collect the sediment on a regular basis it right. will be dredged just no different than the backwash lagoon at Beecham has to be dredged every five days so it's, it's a retention pond basically basically okay. yeah Patrick? All right, thank you. Um, so for F1, I have several questions. Just bear with me for clarity. Okay. Um, F1, uh, the revamp of the four bay, um, will, will all those trees be taken down or just all of them? Primarily, yes. Uh, a lot of that vegetation will be removed. Um, and you know we can certainly work through the design to see if those trees are impacting the capacity of the four bay um, and see if there's something that can maintain because obviously the vegetation is sort of a good thing it helps yeah. slow the water as it comes down we want the water to slow down so the silt and sediment is deposited in the four bay before it hits the pond 
So the vegetation is a good thing, but it's also something that needs to be maintained on a regular basis. So um, you have to balance those items with your design. All righty. I really love trees. I understand. I'm partial to critters, <laughs> love trees, and the... the uh, I'm a hugger, too. The folks who visit a park. Um, the, the ones that I've noticed as well appear to be on the side slopes. So I think it's just something we'd have to look at to see if it affects the capacity of the, of the pond. All right. And PS3 for the amenities for the benches. Will there be any benches at F2 where the, uh, around the loop at the pond? Or are there? I don't think we've gotten to that okay. level of yeah. design yet. Um, okay. I think we associated a, a, a fairly generic budget to replace all of the tables and the, 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 the trash receptacles and things. Where they specifically go, though, I don't think we've done that work yeah, yet. It's something we'll be studying as the project proceeds. And last question. Um, I mentioned this last time, that little island in F3 in the middle of the pond um, where the little turtles hang out at. <laughs> We had talked about maybe a potential floating island. Is that still a potential, or we just they have to hang out on the? the was, I, I think it's a potential. It was in one of the it was other in F4. projects. Okay. Um, yeah. So the primary goal of that project is first, let's get the sediment out of there. Yeah. Let's restore the pond back to the way it, it originally was. Um, Beyond that, I think it would be a great idea to establish a, a vegetative shelf around the pond. And whether we have the budget to include some sort of additional habitat like a floating island, mm -hmm. I think that will just have to be determined as we move through the initial design of getting the pond back to its original state. My last question, I promise. Um, it's, so we are, this budget, well, this project is $1 million short? Mm. Um, no. I'm showing $5 million. It's uh, there's five there's a budget of five point eight million. Yeah. Of that, approximately four point seven is available for construction. The yeah, others for art and okay. testing and fees and things like that. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Mike, thank you, Mayor. I just uh, I'm just going to point out something that, that actually the uh, the history part that y'all have up mm -hmm. is very interesting to read through about this park and about Bear Hollow. And one thing that stood out uh, when I was looking over it and and I didn't know this, that in the, the, part, the zoo was established in 1950s, and the animals from the zoo came from the private backyard collections of individuals, which, mm. <laughs> which seemed a bit odd to me, but just interesting. The, 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 Cole, Roy, the Culpeper you know? family had a big bear in their backyard and gave it to the zoo, it looks like. So. <laughs> any, any donations in the room? By heavens, we'll take them. Dexter? So <clears throat> the 5.8 million... Yes, that must have will that cover the must haves it's, pretty much oh you know i that was a question i was supposed to be more ready for it's going to get us close okay it's going to get us close the thing the one that's the let me go back up here um i so that pond infrastructure f3 mm -hmm. is really expensive <laughs> so that may be the one that we don't get done in that group of must-haves. It just depends on how we can combine these together and, and work our magic. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. All right, we are going to move on to uh, okay. another, uh, another capital project. With the same uh, group of people. Project 13. So let me get this one. This one out and get this one up. All right. All right. So it's the same team. Okay. Um, so uh, Eric and I are again are going to present uh, the preliminary plans for TSPLOS 2018 Project 13, um, which is subproject one which is a West Broad Street and West Hancock Avenue roundabout. Um, again, here's our agenda for tonight. Um, and this was our user group was uh, consisted of two residents and three staff. And their initial project statement is shown here. 
Uh, again, similar to Memorial Park, there's a lot of history with this project. There's five slides of history, um, and it should be in your packet, and it's also in the agenda report when you get there, but I wanted to point out a few highlights that um, in December, uh, y'all uh, approved a CDO, um, and that is the basis for how this project moved forward. And, and then in, not on here, but in November, um, Ronnie and Eric presented a project update to you guys. So on November 9th of 2022, uh, you all had an update at a work session. Um, so as a refresher, this was the CDO that was approved. Um, and it's called option six. It's a five-legged roundabout. Um, so as many of you can attest, we held numerous outreaches, opportunities back before COVID in late 2019 at Hills Chapel Baptist Church, the Rock Springs Community Center, um, Athens Community uh, Career Academy, and GDOT held their own open house virtually in 2022 from April 4th to May 11th. They received 105 formal comments. Basically 66% uh, were supporting the roundabout, 18% opposed it, and 14 were conditional uh, for their support of it. Um, we also then had a stakeholder drop-in meeting at Hills Chapel Baptist Church on the 28th in person. So that was like post-COVID, right? And then, so staff has contacted all of the impacted property owners as it stands today, except for one, they haven't figured out who the owner is of a vacant lot yet. So that'll come out as part of um, the right of way stuff when we do uh, deed research and stuff, title research. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Eric who can speak about where we stand with the GDOT plan development process. Thank you. Hello again. Um, so with a, a, a project that is delivered according to GDOT's plan development process, as you probably are all well aware, these are large, long projects. Uh, a lot of times we start a project and you're looking four or five years off before you get to construction. And then it's another year to several years for construction. So along the way, we have these milestones that we like to try to at least celebrate and keep our morale up and let everybody know things are going well, things are on track, we're still making progress. So um, these are a, a list of uh, significant milestones that have happened since we started. Um, I think it was back in 2018 or 19 where um, the consultant team in Athens engaged the public and we identified lots of alternatives and we ended up with the, um, uh, the CDO um, alternative. And since then, um, we have prepared uh, our concept report that was approved uh, back in uh, August of 21. And then just last year in April, we submitted preliminary construction plans. Um, a little bit more feedback on that process. So even though we submitted preliminary plans in April of last year, GDOT reviewed them and we finally had our, they call it their preliminary field plan review. We had that in August. So there was about four months where they were reviewing, they were doing things on their end, and then we actually had our review. It wasn't until November of last year that they sent us their review comments, we responded, and they accepted that, and that's what moves us forward into the right-of-way plans and final plans. Um, so these are some of the dates that are associated with that. While all of that was going on, we created the document we refer to as the right-of-way construction, uh, right-of-way plan, and that identifies the parcels and pieces of property we think are needed in order to construct the project. So you can see those dates up there. Uh, these are re reasons to celebrate. Um, you'll find that GDOT doesn't make a lot of their schedules for various reasons. These are complicated pieces to move forward. So when you make something on time, it is a reason to kind of jump up and yell. Um, and, and I think the, the team, uh, everyone involved, needs to be um, thanked or congratulated for getting there. Um, 
What I wanted to show here was we grabbed our current um, construction plan. We removed a lot of the technical notes and everything, but I wanted to show how closely we are um, to our original concept. We're still maintaining lots of green space. I think by the time this project gets completed, um, there will be no net loss of green space. We are replacing all of the green space we're impacting Plus that intersection right now is such a large piece of pavement. I think we're actually making it better because there will be the roundabout in the middle, there'll be green space around. Um, the one green piece that you can see on the, uh, on the northern side of the roundabout, that is um, the All-American Plumbing parcel. Um, that is the one parcel that um, is a displacement because of the geometry of the roundabout that will be, uh, that will be removed. Um, on the positive side of that, it is next to Brooklyn Creek. We feel it's something that should be preserved and should be green and, and something that uh, is environmentally friendly to do so, to, to make that improvement. Um, you can see with the orange colors, um, we've established at a minimum five foot sidewalks along all legs of the project, but around the immediate roundabout on all of the, uh, the corners, we've got a 10 foot wide sidewalk to help facilitate um, uh, other users. And finally, um, the yellow areas. Um, right now, if you were to go out there, there is physically no way to cross from one side of West Broad to the other. You have to go to Rock Springs um, or, uh, uh, or up to Holman. Those are the only protected crossings that are out there right now. That's a long way to go, especially if it's raining and it's uphill both directions from the roundabout. So um, with these crossings, there will now be a protected way to cross. The crosswalks on West Broad and West Hancock, those will also have um, RRFBs, I think, which everybody is getting kind of used to seeing. So those will be put on those major crossings. The other minor crossings, Minor Street, uh, Glen Haven and Plaza, um, Hodgson, and then the other leg of Wan West Hancock, those will just be standard crosswalks. Next slide, um, wanted to touch on uh, the right-of-way and easement impacts. Um, the purple color shows uh, property that we will acquire permanently. That's area that's needed um, for, uh, to construct the road, it becomes part of the right-of-way. There are utilities out there. Um, that is purchased and either becomes GDOT right-of-way or Athens right-of-way or simply Athens property. The pink areas, those areas that we need to construct the project and let's say we tie in a driveway and we need to make a smooth transition into the driveway. Those are areas we acquire temporarily. There's construction work that's gone, that's going on in there. They make the improvements and then that property goes back to the, uh, the property owner. So just wanted to give you an impact of how that, that roundabout fits in there and where those impacts to properties are. And with that, I'll turn it back to Diana. All right, thanks, Eric. Um, so Project 13's overall budget is about $3.8 million. Adding to that is the GDOT funding um, to get us a total of about $6.61 million. Um, in the expenses column, um, there are costs for what has been encumbered since the project began in 2018, as well as additional design, public art, right away, utility relocates, miscellaneous PM fees, so it leaves about $2.93 million for construction. The current construction um, is in the asterisk below, which is $3.4 million. So it basically shows that we're going to be about $483,000 short, okay? Um, there's still a lot of unknowns with the whole right-of-way acquisition. There's a lot of contingency in that. There's also a 10% contingency within the uh, $3.4 million estimate. So I think the staff feels that um, once we get further into the right-of-way acquisition, we're going to know if additional funding is necessary, okay? Um, and if it is necessary, TPW staff is going to request additional construction funding from GDOT. 
that I think GDOT's getting a bargain for $2.5 million, that big roundabout. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, and again, if GDOT is unable to come up with, you know, a half a million dollars, then we'll look at other program funds within the T-SPLOSH and SPLOSH program. Um, and then again, you know, the bids might come in good, you know, a year and a half from now when asphalt prices come down stuff. So, um, so your next step is to consider these preliminary plans at the April regular session, as well as authorizing staff to proceed with final plans and to begin right away acquisition. And then there's other, the rest of the timeline, just so you're aware in case constituents wanna know. Um, so we, we would go into right away, it would take about a year. It could take less, could take, I think a year is kind of conservative. Um, then GDOT would approve the final plans. Um, we'd let the project in October of 24. Uh, but then we'd know if we needed any additional funding in November of 24, and construction would start in about January of 25, and it'd last about 14, 18 months. Um, so with that, I will open her up for questions. Thanks for the update, Diana. Sure, I don't have a question. I just am, I'm, I'm really excited about this project. I know you all have done a lot of work on it and, and have held a lot of public engagement with this. And uh, mm -hmm. and I really, at the end of the day, once this is finished, I think it'll be, you know, we'll, we'll see a different uh, West Broad area there and, and just a lot safer and, uh, and it'll look nice too. So that's good. So yeah. thanks for sticking with and, it. And as staff yeah. and um, TPW and SPLOST, I think that the plan is to continue to reach out to the neighbors to let them know about when things are happening and what maybe staging is going to look like because it's I think it's four or five stages. Yes, um, at least four distinct uh, stages. Because traffic's going to be still flowing while right. we're building. Okay. And it looked like y'all were going to start in January of 2025. Is that mm -hmm. is that? Yeah. Correct. That's the plan. Correct. Yeah. And yes, I think it's the intent to keep educating the public on the use of roundabouts. And um, some people still have not used one. They're, they're pretty, they're getting pretty, um, they're all over the place. But um, we'll continue education and outreach and um, certainly want to have everybody aware of that before construction starts. Dexter. Yeah, and most definitely educational for me <clears throat> because of um, with West Ball being a major Oh, yeah. Corner, you know, yeah. to downtown. I'm, I'm really wondering how that traffic is going to really flow, especially on the game day or mm -hmm. school is in, and you know, buses coming from HT Edwards. So, um, and I have actually one of the first thing that came to my attention was about about this roundabout and and the impact it was going to have. I don't know no that neighborhood in that mm -hmm. particular area, but the traffic flow. Mm -hmm. um, I come to a roundabout every day off Tallahassee Road, mm -hmm. and of course people don't, they don't yield, and when you got a really busy day, I'm, I'm just wanting the impact of traffic on a game day going, and again, I'm not sure whether we even consider doing traffic patterns Certainly. to, to really consider that. The traffic man. Um, and John Walker is with Kimley Horn, he's part of the consultant team, he's okay. been uh, with us since the start of the project looking at traffic. I think part of the answer um, might be to, to have police officers, law enforcement out there helping with traffic if there are intersections that need additional guidance um, on a game day situation. Um, I will say before I, I let you talk about traffic, um, I think the beauty of the roundabout is even during heavy times, traffic, traffic gets congested. The beauty of the roundabout is off peak hours when you don't come up to a red light at nine o'clock at night and have to sit there for several minutes waiting for nothing. You approach the roundabout, you slow down and you move through. The beauty of the roundabout is it's a, a, a slow speed intersection. So it's much safer for everyone. You, you, you eliminate the potential for T-bone of, uh, of vehicles, one vehicle crossing in front of the other. Um, so from a safety and, and a level of service standpoint, they're, Sure. Hey, I'm John Walker. So you may find this interesting, and I'm not sure it was mentioned. In 2019, GDOT actually did their own study and identified this location as a roundabout because it would work better 
than a signalized intersection. And you're right, it does slow the traffic, keeps moving, so you're constantly, the flow's just constantly moving. The capacity of this is so much better than a standard signalized intersection that it's gonna operate at a great level of service, even at the elevated, you know, elevated volumes that you would see on a game day. Now, I will admit, there are points on any road or any intersection, if traffic gets so great, anything will break. And that, you, like you said, special events traffic, many times you would have officers out there, but that would be such a special event, special occasion. The everyday flow, you know, and we push traffic out 20 years. Um, this is a great solution. Um, and you can imagine there's been a lot of traffic study work for something like this, GDOT. I mean, there's this been a lot of effort towards making sure this is going to operate as be you know, best it can operate. So okay. it, it really will. It's going to be amazing as far as how well the traffic's going to work. I, I hope so. Yeah. Again, in my, in my deal, is, it's a main drag. Mm -hmm into downtown sure. and, and, and out town. It's just really so. nice and just forget traffic for just it's, it's a different look, a different feel. All the motorists when they approach this it's like, okay, I am in a special place. This is different. This is you know interesting. I'm gonna and, and it will slow the traffic down and I think it will create a kind of an entry. You know sorry Andrew. It's a gate it'll be a gateway. Okay. Yeah. And my second question is about Doing construction, mm -hmm. and you know how. Again, when you're trying to do a roundabout, you're trying to figure it, traffic gonna have to be diverted somewhere. Um, doing this construction piece, I mean, am I right? Am I wrong? I mean, no. I mean, I mean okay. it's, it's staging is a very huge part of this. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. Go it on. is so. We have been able to maintain two lanes of traffic through the intersection throughout construction. Okay. But it is obviously going to be difficult. It, it is going to slow folks down. It will be aggravating um, the way almost all road construction is. But we have been able to maintain the through traffic throughout construction. Okay. There will be temporary closing of traffic on side roads. If you, There's only one way to sometimes put a pipe in the ground. That's to cut open the road. So when something like that happens, you get the pipe in the ground, you cover it up, and you reestablish traffic back over a temporary crossing. So there will be inconveniences like that, absolutely. But the intent is to maintain traffic throughout. Good. And I know there's a barbershop mm -hmm. over there. Are they going to be affected at all? So we did meet with them, absolutely. Um, and we are maintaining their access. Um, and we, we reviewed the impacts with them. And they thought that they could perform their business at, at perfectly fine with, with the room that we are giving them to, to get vehicles around the building. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jesse. Thank you. This is great. I'm really looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to the frustrating two lanes for a while to have this mm -hmm. on the other end of it. Um, I, I do have two questions. One is um, how does this... Um, this design dovetail with the broader, longer-term vision of the Athens in Motion plan for this corridor. Um, um, I, I I know that Athens in Motion is in support of this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've heard that too. I guess I'm just curious. You know, while we're designing this intersection, you know, my understanding is somewhere in this area, eventually, there's a vision to have bicycles to be able to get through somehow. And that's obviously not built into this design. So is there like a portion of the right of way that could eventually be applied to that or? Well, and then if you, if you heard what he said, the, you can see that there are wider sections mm -hmm. of sidewalk, which are basically 10 foot wide instead of five foot. So they could become a multi-use pathway. As we and so they're trying to, trying to figure out how to dovetail it in with maybe the Atlanta highway mm -hmm. improvements. Um, and then, you know, we still have T Splash 2023 has another one and a half million for the whole West Broad and Hancock corridor improvements. So I believe if someone is in traffic on, on, on a bicycle, they could continue through the roundabout on, on their bicycle. But with the, with the wider paths that we've provided around the, in the immediate um, outside of the roundabout, if there are any paths or trails leading into the intersection, they should be able to be tied into those. Okay, and, and off, off the street. And off the street, okay. correct. Um, and then my other question was, you know, those crosswalks, um, 
I'm thinking especially about what's currently, you know, fairly high speed roads and, you know, if you're taking a right coming down the hill on West Broad and to turn up West Hancock, <coughs> how are we keeping those crossings safe for pedestrians and not just having high speed cars treating it like a slip lane? So we will have advanced signage uh, up the hill. So as you're coming down the hill, you'll at least see advanced signage that the roundabout is coming. There'll be advanced pavement markings to show you which lane you need to be in as you approach the roundabout. Um, the roundabout itself is designed for slow speed. So before where someone's coming down the hill and they see the green light, they're probably keeping right at 40 50, or 70 50, miles an hour or whatever. 60 mm -hmm. down the hill. As you come down, that, the, the geometry of that roundabout is designed so that you have to slow down to hopefully around 20 as you enter the roundabout. That in conjunction with the RRFDs, which if you're crossing, you press that button and you get some flashing lights, that should warn folks coming down the hill that there's someone trying to make that crossing. And those are the immediate response flashing beacons, right? Not the big one. Right. And, and you've got, if you look at, say, you're crossing the, the <clears throat> east side, mm -hmm. you've got the, 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 I guess it's a pedestrian refuge in the middle, so you don't have to cross all of it at once. You cross just the two lanes instead of mm -hmm. four or five, whatever we have now, right? And then you wait, and then you hit the, hit the thing again, and then you cross the other two lanes. So again, and you're only, you're only having to deal with one direction of traffic each time you're crossing, too. Okay. So that should make it safer. None of the crossings are planned to be like raised crossings, though. There's no like rumble strips leading up or anything like that. Um, I don't think GDOT allows that. GDOT will not allow that, at least as of today. They will not allow that on a state route. Um, I like them. Uh, I think they have their place. I, I think it's a, really a, a function of how much traffic you have out there. I think that conversation may continue, but at this point, we are not planning any. Uh, Tiffany? Um, <clears throat> my, my question is for the residents within this area. Um, I know that you had 105 formal um, comments, mm -hmm. um, but because this was um, well, 2022, not even a year ago. Um, throughout each phase of the construction, will residents be notified? And if so, how does that look? Is, will it just be, you look on the website, you'll know, or will it be pre-planned so that, say, we need to put a, something on someone's door to let them know what's going on within the area? Well, I think that's probably a question that's I see PIO is not in here, but I mean, I think we would probably work to put a website together like we did for the Clayton Street project. Um, that would, and then maybe, maybe how you guys have the notifications where things are happening. They could sign up if they wanted to be notified about something, and they could put flash things up there so it would come to your email. You know, like when there's a, I don't know, when there's a traffic incident, I get them on my email. Um, uh, I think we could work with, with PIO to come up with something to way to proactively notify residents, I think anybody in the neighborhood. Yeah, because I know that that area has a large senior group mm -hmm. that, that necessarily don't have an email address okay. or go to websites. Okay. So how does that look? So we'll, we'll have to work on another way to maybe other than, a, you know, yeah. something maybe more a little, maybe go put door hangers on, yeah. something like that. I, I yeah. think that that's we can accommodate that yeah. certainly. I, I just I just think that it'll be coming courtesy, right? Yeah. And I would tell you when we were when we did our re outreach at Hill uh, Chapel, we had a lot of people there, and almost every one of them, and they were mostly residents coming in. So because we we partnered with uh, West Broad Rising mm -hmm. and the Land Trust, at, and that kind of made it a bigger bigger group of people coming, not just to hear about the roundabout, but to hear about some of the things that the land trust was doing with grant monies. Thank you. Mike? Sure. And just to um, uh, piggyback on just uh, Commissioner Rules, I didn't realize GDOT doesn't allow the rumple, rumple strips anymore. Uh, that, that, uh, is that what you call them, rumple strips? I, I was referring to the elevated... The oh, 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 okay. Yeah. That, that, if, okay. if we, if okay, we think a rumble strip, we can always talk to them about it. Uh, um, well, I was just thinking about that in terms of five points so I'm on another, another area, but it would be good here as well. But my question for this area specifically is 
where you have the crosswalks on the plaza and on West Hancock. I'm no engineer, but it seems awfully close to the roundabout. And if I was going around that curve in the roundabout, am I going to just come up on somebody that's in the crosswalk and not realize that they're there? You see what I'm <laughs> saying? I mean, will you... Maybe maybe which, it is maybe it one? is you mean, it, you mean those two right there that the, don't have this one and this one yeah that don't have the RF RRF RFPs so the West Hancock one will have an RRF oh they on will it. okay um, we felt it's, traffic was heavy enough on it, that to it, to warrant I that. think this is the one he was talking about that would no 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 I was talking about the ones closest to the roundabout itself are they are they is is the plaza going to have two and the plaza we didn't notice a, a high traffic volume on that. But that, that's something we can look at, and, and that is something that I think could be um, modified pretty easily. Yeah. I just think about my, my elderly dad who's driving and has, has one good eye. He probably shouldn't be driving, but, uh, <laughs> but he'd come upon this and just, just wonder what's going on. So he'll make it around the roundabout, but he might, you know, I hope he, he, doesn't, I, I hope he doesn't see the, <laughs> the pedestrian in there. the walk. He's going around. <laughs> And you can see the geometry change on West Hancock. We tried really hard to slow folks down. That is a horrible movement right now with folks oh, coming down the hill and yeah. merging on on their way westbound. So um, the, the whole intent of this is to slow everyone down putting, and make them look around. Putting those curves in is purposeful. Yes. Yeah, that's good. Okay, thank you. Are there roundabouts i mean obviously not in athens but similar that have this similar amount of traffic volume in the state or i mean i'm yes. with dexter i'm concerned about the volume of traffic on here i mean i love the idea but what is the effect on the volume so when we do get up to these volumes and i'm going to dump it off on john in here in a minute um when we do get up to these volumes we move from a single lane roundabout to a multi-lane roundabout and you can see this is multi-lane this is further complicated because it's also multi-leg, but um, yes, in Georgia, we've got lots of multi-lane roundabouts handling this volume, this volume. of traffic. Perfect. Yes, sir. Jesse? Yeah, I guess I just wanted to, you know, I appreciate Commissioner Hamby's comments. You know, um, if we're putting RFBs everywhere else, in my mind, it makes sense to put them on the plaza, too, even if current traffic flow doesn't justify it, to have that uniformity to the amenity for pedestrians and then... Uh, the curb bump out hopefully slows people down on that immediate right turn if they were to come from Hancock onto the plaza. But just thinking about realistically the way people in cars behave and as cars get larger and larger, how deadly it is to get hit in a crossing. Um, anything we can do to provide safer amenities, I, I'd like to see us pursue. So if so we can ensure an, an RFB at that crosswalk at the plaza, that would make sense to me. And if there's anything we can do in the vein of rumble strips or something else, you know, if an elevated crossing is off the table right now because of GDOT policy, something else that physically encourages that slowing down, um, I think would be would be very valuable. Would you feel the same way about minor street crossing? Yeah. Yeah. In in my mind, if we're going to have them on those main roads, having them on the slightly smaller roads too makes okay. sense. But. And then the only thing I have to say about the rumble strips is they are loud and if you're living right next to a rumble strip yeah. You, you know. yeah i don't know if there's a way to maybe get with our i'm assuming they're already looped into this but like our, our vision zero and our bike peg coordinator who are kind of developing some new standards for roads to see what yep. their top suggestion we might be beyond what's already <coughs> depicted or if they're kind of like hey this is as good as it gets already but I, i'm just thinking about how that looks like a slip lane to some degree in certain portions like if you're coming down west broad and you enter in that right lane and you know you've got the arrows you know it's coming but you could still pretty easily kind of whip around that and later at night when it's harder to see people and traffic is less you can whip around it extra fast by using both lanes like they're one which we see people do and, and so if there's a way to you know force cars to slow down a bit more and, to keep and people one thing from getting we didn't hurt. discuss is that this will be lit this intersection will have overhead lighting. Um, Appreciate everybody's input. I, I have gotten some complaints about the rumble strips near where Athena Drive and Spring Valley Road come together. Uh, so I know that, that that's the sound is a concern. I, I do appreciate the design team really minimizing property impact in an earlier iteration of it. And as you moved up 
plaza there, there were prospectively more impacts and so you've done a great job there and, and honestly you know given my experience with these elsewhere you know my hope is that in another five years gdot's looking at alps road and west broad thanks everyone all right all right uh one last capital project uh which is a uh site that we've talked about very recently and this is the fire station number five replacement uh currently the fire station that's on the corner of Whit davis and cedar shoals <laughs> Did Keith put you up to that? No. no. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, Mayor Commissioners. Uh, my name is Daniel Guerin, one of the SPLOS project man managers. Uh, and also joining me today is uh, Chief Mark Melvin. Uh, with the fire department. Today we're going to talk about the SPLOS 2020 Project 6 uh, fire station number 5 replacement uh, site selection criteria. The last time you saw me, we had, uh, you guys had approved uh, moving forward with this. So today I'm coming uh, to you with the actual uh, criteria and then the public input along with it. We'll go through the typical project history the current service map, the site selection criteria, we'll go over the public input results, uh, some upcoming next steps, project budget, and then I'll find, uh, end it with some questions. Uh, this is uh, some old history. I won't go through it, but uh, on the next slide, I'll go through some of the new history from the uh, events that happened from the, the last time we had met. On uh, February, February 7th, uh, Mayor Commission approved uh, starting this process. On February 13th, the uh, site selection uh, committee had reviewed the uh, site selection uh, criteria and allowed us to produce that to the public uh, for um, uh, input. On, six, on the 16th of February, that went out as an online survey and uh, that remained open until March 5th. On March 3rd, we did hold an in-person public input forum at fire station number seven. And then um, on March 13th, which was yesterday, we did uh, provide that public input information to the um, site selection committee and they voted uh, unanimously that the criteria uh, was in line with the project needs. So this is the current fire station coverage map. As you can see, um, fire station five and, and number seven have quite a bit of an overlap. And there's some areas around the uh, south and east side of fire station number five that, that doesn't have uh, coverage um, by fire station number five within that two and a half mile radius. So what the intent is, is to uh, relocate number five so that it does better cover the residents and that, that southeast side of uh, Athens Clark County. So what we had done here, uh, and this is uh, uh, partly in conjunction with the, the user group and with some of the comments that we had had uh, from public input about the current location. Um, so this, uh, particular area is roughly the location of where we would like to place fire station number five and the reason for that is because um, in this particular area both north south and east and west anything within that that proximity would allow greater coverage for the residents in that area anything outside of that you start to have larger coverage gaps on the north side the east side the west side and then on the on, excuse me on the west side you begin to begin to have more overlap with fire station number seven so one of the things we wanted to do was mitigate that that overlap with fire station seven not be too far north south or east but
but also to, to try to put it in an area that is going to cover the most people that we can. So as far as uh, the, the technical values, um, we have property area, um, location and accessibility, utility, site ownership, uh, street type, zoning, uh, topography, and permitting, um, each broken down into to highly wanted, or the must-haves, the highly wanted and nice-to-haves. I'm not going to go through and, and read each one, but at the end, if there are some questions about some of this criteria, I'll be happy to answer that. These are the technical values, and then next we have the, the community values, station visibility, adjacent properties, um, economic impacts, community, uh, environment, uh, joint development, and then proximity to, to the bus stop. Now the public input, uh, we, one of the comments we got back from the site selection committee is, is trying to get this information out to the public um, and try to get as many responses back from the public as possible. So we, you know, PIO assisted us with, with trying to get that information out as, in as many avenues as possible. Um, that include, you know, it was announced uh, on WUGA. We also seen it in the Atlanta, Athens Banner Herald. It was on uh, ACTV, emailed to the neighborhood leaders, um, the District 8 newsletter by Commissioner Myers, um, just really trying to reach out to the community and get as much input as, as we possibly can. We did also hold the in-person forum on March 2nd at fire station number seven. Um, on the, for the online survey, we, had, we did have 17 responses. Um, the comments that we had are, are listed below and largely due to the uh, comments that were provided were based on location. And that was kind of one of the reasons why we went back to the table with the user group to try to establish that, that, um, that area where the station needed to be really relocated. Um, in terms of the site selection criteria, there were 17, the 17 responses that we had received on the online survey agreed that the, the technical uh, values were appropriate with the, the pro, the, this project. And as far as the community values, uh, 16 agreed and one did not agree. But unfortunately, a comment was not left as to why that is. And just to give you some background on um, where we at and we, we where we are at in this stage, um, this will go uh, site selection will go to mayor and commission uh, for approval on April seventh, and that will allow the uh, the project team to begin to uh, identify some properties in the area, work with GIO uh, to help uh, establish those properties, and then uh, we'll bring that back to the um, site selection committee. Um, spring of uh, 2023 is provided uh, recommendations uh, of pro uh, project sites to the site selection committee. We'll take that information and again go out for public input. Um, we'll, uh, that'll actually come back to the site selection committee to make sure that those properties uh, are in uh, evaluated appropriately and meet the project goals and then we'll come back to mayor and commission uh, with those potential properties and then after that's approved we'll do uh, physical studies about how those property or how that footprint fits on that property uh, and then we'll bring that recommendation back to mayor commission uh, hopefully at winter of 23 uh, spring 24. the current uh, project budget uh, for land acquisition is five hundred thousand dollars and then from there i'll open up with uh, any questions all right Sounds good. so we've just Thanks. got to uh, affirm it in a gender report these site selection criteria so everybody good yes sir all right thank you yeah, really thank appreciate you. it
All right, so uh, moving on to our next item. Uh, of course, on an annual basis, we receive funds from the federal government uh, because we're what they term an entitlement community, which means we receive direct funds rather than have them flow through the state or some other conduit. Uh, so these community development block grant uh, awards um, are uh, something we see in draft every springtime, and uh, this is no exception. So um, Melinda Lord from HCD is here along with Roderick, uh, department head. And uh, so we're gonna hear about their recommendations for us. Sorry. <laughs> I need my notes. Good evening. Good, evening. Good evening. Tonight I will be presenting the Housing and Community Development Department's FY24 Community Development Block Grant Funding Recommendations for the Annual Action Plan 4. The purpose is to preview HCD's consolidated plan and goals, explain the CDBG application review process, review CDBG proposals and funding recommendations, and review the remaining AAP4 schedule. The HUD required consolidated plan is a five-year needs assessment, resource review and gaps analysis, and tool for making data-driven, place-based investments in the community by use of community consultation and citizen participation. HCD is currently operating within its annual action plan three, and tonight's proposals are for the annual action plan four, and allows for activities within these five approved consolidated plan goals. The 10 member citizen advisory committee is appointed by you, commission and mayor, with three year terms. The Vision Committee supports HCD in its annual action plan process by providing input on emergent, emerging community needs and by sharing feedback to assist HCD staff in prioritizing CDBG funding each year. Each member provides their individual priorities, but the average of all is used to determine the commission or the committee priorities. CDBG funding for the past four years includes a budget cap allocation of 15% for public service activities, a 20% budget cap on planning and administrative support, with the remaining 65% eligible for affordable housing, economic development, and public facilities and improvements projects, with an emphasis on affordable housing activities as the CONPLAN priority goal. 
This year, HUD released its annual CDBG and Home Awards in late February, allocating $1.22 million in CDBG to HCD for its FY24 Annual Action Plan 4 activities, and our Home Award was $852,608. Unfortunately, CDBG was decreased this year by $82,326 from our FY23 award of $1.303 million. For FY24 CDBG funding request, HCD received 23 applications requesting $2.57 million for FY24 CDBG activities. Of these 23, 16 projects have been recommended for funding at a total of $1.255 million. HCD did not receive any public facilities and improvements applications for this round. Excuse me, who would normally apply for that? Uh, public facilities improvements? What? To us. Us. Okay. Well, leisure services, but I mean, it is open to um, for profit, but we haven't received any, and they would have to meet very specific criteria to be eligible. But we do typically. Um, we're in communication with a couple of nonprofit entities in the public right now, okay. um, in the community right now, that are interested in public facilities and improvements okay. projects. And if you'll notice in the agenda item, we have submitted a request for carry forward funding to be used okay. to do a public facilities and improvements project. That's good to know. Thank you. Real You're quick welcome. clarifying question. Um, I assumed it was just a typo when I was reading through this before, but is it, it's actually 15 total recommended, right? I'm including admin, planning and admin. Okay, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. The available funding for FY24 CDBG is, of course, $1.22 million, but we do have some available reallocation funds that we're recommending to support um, affordable housing economic development projects um, to make up for the shortfall that we received in funding this year. HCD did receive two ineligible applications for public services. Uh, we did reach out to both of the applicants to provide technical assistance, but neither took advantage of that offer, and one was not eligible due to lack of 501c3 verification, and the other submitted a public services application that actually was a public facilities and improvements mm -hmm. project. And this chart is just a visual demonstration of the FY24 application funding requested at $2.57 million, which exceeded HCD's available funding by $1.35 million. And now we'll get into FY24 affordable housing requests and recommendations. Athens Habitat for Humanity uh, requested $300,000 in assistance to support <clears throat> minor to moderate homeowner re occupied rehab, handicap accessibility, and support for rehab of new construction activities through their Brush with Kindness, eHarp, and Renew Athens program. HCD is re recommending $147,000. Vision Committee prioritized this as number one. The Athens Housing Authority requested $344,457 to support acquisition, demolition, and support for future new construction activities. HCD is recommending $75,000. Vision Committee prioritized this is number three. The Athens Land Trust requested $367,883 to support acquisition, down payment assistance, and support for rehab and new construction activities. HCD recommends $182,000. Vision Committee priority is number two. And Historic Athens requested $172,268 to support minor to moderate homeowner occupied rehab of homes 50 years or older. HCD is recommending $130,000 and the Vision Committee priority is number four. Neighborhood revitalization projects include activities of sufficient scope, size and scope to positively impact a geographic area. 
nurses services benefit residents of census tracts 301 and 302 in East Athens and census tracts 6 and 9 in the Hancock Corridor. East Athens Development Corporation is a certified CBDO eligible to carry out activities targeted in census tracts 301 and 302. For economic development requests and recommendations, Athens Land Trust requested $125,713 to support adult entrepreneurship training and support for new and existing businesses, including youth basic business training activities for their West Broad Farmers Market and Grow Your Business Micro Enterprise Program. HCD recommends $62,000 Vision Committee prioritized this as number three. East Athens Development Corporation requested $50,000 to support its job coaching and employment placement assistance and support bridging the gap program. HCD recommends $30,000. Vision Committee prioritized number four. EADC, in partnership with <coughs> Innovative Healthcare Institute, uh, proposes to provide medical training and certification, including job placement <coughs> assistance through its Operation One Family at a Time certification program. They're requesting $125,000. HCD is recommending $112,000. This was the number one economic development priority for Vision Committee. EADC, in partnership with Chess and Community Conference, United Community Outreach and Cultivating a Lifetime of Legacy Nonprofits are partnered to provide economic development and neighborhood revitaliza I'm sorry, revitalization activities for youth. Um, and they are requesting $30,000. We're recommending, I'm sorry, they're asking $50,000. We're recommending $50,000. And this was Vision Committee priority number two. And finally, Goodwill of North Georgia is requesting $62,500 to support adult entrepreneurship training and support for new and existing businesses through their Good Biz Microenterprise Program. <laughs> HCD recommends $60,000, and the Vision Committee prioritized this as number five. Okay, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So, um, the Operation <coughs> One Family at a Time certification program, um, what is that? Can you explain that? Mm -hmm. Yes, Innovative Healthcare uh, Network, in, or um, Innovative Healthcare in partnership with the ADC uh, provides CNA, phlebotomy technician, nurse practitioner, and medical assistants certification training. So they do the training, then they provide the certification, and then they provide the job placement assistance. Okay. And you get data from all of these entities at, um, once funds are dispersed, correct? We get monthly reporting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Could you share that with us? Because that's something that you can share. What, the monthly reporting? Yes. Anytime you ask. And, um, Athens Land Trust and then Goodwill North Georgia seem like they're doing the same similar programming. It's similar in that they're both micro enterprise, however, their focus is different. Athens Land Trust tends to focus on agricultural based and vendor based business mm -hmm. acumen, where as Goodwill is open to all of East a or oh, I'm sorry, all of Athens and its existing new any kind of business. So where, you, where one has a more targeted audience, the other is more broad. Uh, Ovita, and then we'll move on through the rest of the presentation. So uh, the priority does not necessarily match the funding. So it's a priority, but it might be less funding. And, and the one I'm looking at is, um, like for example, the East Athens uh, 50,000, and we get, I mean, yeah, 50,000, and we're giving them 30. But it's priority number one, but it is priority number two. But it, the priority does not actually match the, the dollar amount. That's the, what I'm trying the to priority do. that you're looking at is specific to the vision committee. Okay. They don't recommend funding, okay. they just simply prioritize based on 
their review and their analysis. Okay. And that, then they yeah, make that recommendation. Yes, ma'am. Ready? Public services activities are ineligible um, action for CDBG entitlement grants, but are capped at 15% of the total annual award allocation. For the annual action plan for HCD is proposing to award the full 15% available for public service eligible activities. And to implement a more strategic approach to public service activities to maximize impact on recipients of those public services and due to increased insurance coverage requirements for contracting, the FY24 CDBG public service application minimum threshold request is $30,000 and allows for up to six projects to be awarded. Any public service activity awarded with FY24 CDBG funding may allocate up to 20% of the total budget to cover administrative activities, including those increased insurance costs. For public, they can any. CDBG award can allocate up to 20% of its administrative budget, which insurance falls under administration. Uh -huh. They can allocate 20% of their award budget to, in, to assist with payment for those costs. Is that new? No, ma'am. Okay. It's most of our public service awards <clears throat> in the past have been very low. Uh -huh. There's not a whole lot of money to use for administrative costs, so most use it for all direct service. Okay, okay that's good to know. Okay. So for public service challenge grants, Advantage Behavioral Health Systems requested $30,000 to support Homeless Day Service Center activities that assist people experiencing homelessness obtain access to mainstream benefits and services. HCD recommends $30,000. Vision Committee priority is number four. The ARC UMOC Commonwealth Athens Program requested $30,000 to support individual families with financial assistance, financial counseling, and financial literacy activities. HCD is recommending 30,000. Vision Committee priority is number 10. Chess and Community Conference has requested $30,000 to support its comment, I mean, I'm sorry, its project rewire program that supports youth-focused STEM financial literacy and entrepreneurship activities. HCD recommends $30,000 and the vision committee priority is number eight. Divas Who Win requested $30,274 to support its She Works program, which is workforce development training for women struggling with substance abuse disorders, poverty, incarceration, and or mental illness. Staff is recommending $30,000. Vision Committee priority is number five. Family Promise of Athens is requesting support for permanent housing placement through rental assistance and child care payments assistance for families experiencing homelessness through their homeless prevention program. They requested $40,000. HCD recommends $33,000 and the Vision Committee priority is number <coughs> three. Sparrow's Nest requested $30,000 to support direct service provision of food hygiene kits payment for Georgia IDs and employment related costs for individuals experiencing homelessness. They staff recommended $30,000 and the vision committee priority is number two. Next steps in the schedule. Let, let, we just got a couple more slides right, and then we'll get to questions. Sorry. It's all right. We have the agenda setting meeting next week. Uh, you will commit to your voting session on April 4th. We, HCD, will publish the notice for annual action plan public comment period on April 9th in the Athens Banner Herald. We will publish the full AAP4 draft for a 30 day public comment period and that will occur on April 10th. The annual action plan is due to HUD on May 17th, and then we will initiate contracting in May and June of this year. 
and the FY24 CDBG funding becomes available on July 1st, 2023. Oh, sorry. Questions, I'm comments? Finished, Dexter. Sorry. You're fine. Um, so I noticed at this community, at this community council on aging was priority number one, and we gave them no funding. It was the vision committee priority number one, right. the average. Right. So, again, the HCD had to try to prioritize what it determined to be the highest needs in the community. And although we recognize that what ACCA does for its senior population, they did have one of the highest budgets available to them from exterior sources, whereas many of the other programs that applied for funding had much smaller pots of funding to support their programs. So in order to meet what we determined were the priority needs, three homeless programs, homeless focused programs, one youth focused program, one financial assistance focused program, we determined that we had to unfortunately not fund what the vision committee determined as number one. But I would also say that we could not imagine not recommending Chess and Community Conference for funding, but they were only number eight. Yeah, well, I got a little bit of angst about that, so, <laughs> but I'll let it go. Um, you know, because, you know, again, I think we need to support our elderly community, and I know they do really good work, regardless of the budget they got, and I, I got some issues with that, so, especially, especially after the vision committee prioritized them as number one, so. I understand. Yeah. And they'll receive funds through our general fund if, mm -hmm. if we continue that. Mm -hmm. Jesse? Yeah, I guess kind of similar question, but for the other ranked higher than was recommended projects, you know, we see the Georgia Conflict Center's Restorative Justice Diversion Program ranked sixth, and the Athens Pride and Queer Collective ranked seventh. So, you know, what was the decision by staff? What was the rationale for the decision by staff to fund the ARC and Chesson community over those? Georgia Conflict Center is currently under grant, but they have not been meeting their performance measures or expending the funding that has been allocated. We anticipate that there will be a significant amount of money being returned to the middle line. And just so you know, there's a couple of things about HUD. First, we have a timeliness requirement. If we exceed 1.5 times our annual allocation, we can get a finding. And we may have to return money. And if we are doing that, if we're not meeting our timeliness and expenditures, it impacts our annual award. And as we've seen, we were a decrease this year. That is an impact of money being returned from agencies that were awarded that <coughs> were not able to expend all of it. So we have to look at not just what we know is needed, but actually what is that being done when agencies are awarded. And I'm sorry, what was the other? The Athens Pride and Queer Collective. They had their gender affirming medical care project. It was number was, seven, yeah. I believe. Again, this this was a new application and mm -hmm. determining the great need in the community for the other activities. We just had to make a decision based on our experience and knowledge. Okay, so in, in summary, the the short version for why staff recommended lower projects ranked lower by the vision committee over projects ranked higher are ACCA's, you know, got other sources of revenue that staff expects they can use to pay for this. Uh, the Georgia Conflict Center isn't um, likely to expend their previous award, which is a problem. And then with Athens Pride and Queer Collective, it's just because they're new. Is that, is that basically it? It's not just that they're new, it's that we, unfortunately, uh -huh. public services is the smallest amount of money we have available, but sure. we get the greatest number of applications. Once again, the vision Which means we get priority. the greatest number of questions about this, too, usually, right? And so I guess, you know, I, I, Which is, I, we're, it's fine. We need to it, kind of explain why we're going to ultimately affirm your recommendation. So why, why are we going against the Citizen Committee's recommendation to fund that? before these, you know, I need to understand that. <laughs> well, the vision committee doesn't determine the recommendations. Uh -huh. They just make suggestions and 
they provide us with their priorities. Okay. But it's not the end all determination for those recommendations. It's just a part of the process for HCD to help determine what our recommendations are <coughs> and where they're coming from. Okay. We try to be in alignment with our vision committee, but sometimes sure. we're just not, unfortunately. Sure. And so basically HC, HCD's identified these other projects as meeting a greater need in the community based on your other metrics. Okay. That would be fair. Avita? Um, <coughs> the next CEBG application process is when? We will do another release in October for FY25 funding. Um, and, and, I, and I ask that question because we have been talking about um, the problems that we're having with gangs and when to me when we do youth development Lane's head popped right up when I said that. Uh, when you, I'm sorry. We, <laughs> uh, but when you do when we're talking about youth development, uh, I would love for us to have a conversation about how those intertwine with youth development and not have it as a separate um, a separate entity. I think youth development, and I think all the stuff that these agencies are doing is um, good youth work, and I think <coughs> we need we need to have a goal too. You know, can we show how this may deter uh, gang violence, and especially with the younger groups? So I would love for us to be able to spell that out in the next. Um, um, application uh, process my other well can we address that one first yes sir okay so the vision committee performs a couple of roles one of which we just talked about another role that they provide is helping to set the priorities for the funding so is, is that am I and their priorities for what they'd like to see with CDBG are telegraph so correct if you know if the Commission wants to do that you know, I guess you could tell the vision committee. Um, do they do we come back to the commission and they approve those priorities that the vision committee? No, if we were to issue a targeted award system, we would need to do that prior to the October RFP <coughs> release. So we would need to be directed that all public services will be targeted to only youth activities. So. What we would do is make sure that we notified all nonprofit applicants that unless they're planning to submit an application specifically for youth targeted activities, they're el they are not eligible to apply. So the, since we don't come back after the vision committee sets the priorities, I guess if y'all did, if you wanted to do that, you could do a CDO when you approve these, but you would preempt with their normal role. So CDO for next application. Mm -hmm. Right. For FY25. The other thing worth noting, just in terms of the kind of broader youth development space, is we're looking for some time in late April for a, about a half day meeting so that we can better define th that set of violence prevention and youth development priorities. And I guess that's where I'm headed at. I'm, 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 you know, I think the, the, the groups that do youth development work do great work, do great work. And, but when we see um, the gang violence, like we're seeing it, there just seems to be, a, should be an intersection. I'm not even suggesting you write a anti-gang proposal just for anti-ganging. I'm saying how do we connect those two things together for a bigger good? So April is going to be some discussion about it. I'm good. But a lot of times we do this work, and it, and it is about funding. That, that, that was my point. Right, sure. and it would likely be a public service type grant. And again, we can do targeted. We have done that before with our CV funding. We have been very specific about the types of activities that we will fund and the types of applications that we'll accept. So we can do that. We just have not typically done that in the past. We have opened up our public services to meet all of the goals. But it is something that's possible to do. And, I, and that's why I went to that because I, did, I didn't remember there being a fall opportunity to redirect it. So if that is the intent, that's what I'm saying, 
you could take a chance to see if the vision committee took that lead and went with it, or they might do something totally different, and then you miss that opportunity. So if you want to do that, then y'all would have to intervene at this point early on. Is that fair? That's okay. fair. I'll follow up with the, the manager and make sure I got directions. Uh, Dexter and then Jesse. No, you know I'm a, I'm a path. I'm okay, path. sure. Path. Jesse. Okay, I'll try to add two left. We try to be quick. Um, you know, the first is these projects in the beginning for affordable housing and um, economic development. Um, oh, you know, a lot of these are at maybe half the requested amount, and a lot of times I think we have this conversation around. You know, are we giving an amount to the proposal that's meaningful enough for them to be able to follow through on? the intended scope of the proposal as it came forward. So could you just kind of help me understand, maybe you know, using one or two of these as an example for like how staff still believes that, just as an example, like 147,000 of the 300,000 requested by Athens Area Habitat, does that still allow them to do what they've stated they intend to do with the Brush With Kindness project? We request that all applicants bring leveraging funds to the table so they understand from the beginning they can ask for whatever they want, but we're never going to be able to fund everything they're asking mm -hmm. for. So they do bring their own funding to the table. We also work closely with them once a budget has been reduced be below what they've requested to reduce the number of projects that they will do to meet that need. One, again, a major determining factor for HCD staff in making funding recommendation is what they spent the prior year. And many of our affordable housing and economic development projects require carry forward into the next year an extra three months to expend all of their award as they're gaining new money. So we try <coughs> to anticipate that based on their former performance and expenditures <coughs> and reduce that amount accordingly if that's been the case. Okay, so that's likely the explanation f for most of those disparities. Correct. Okay. Um, and then my last question, you, you spoke to this in your presentation where there were a couple applicants that we see you know, designated as ineligible for the challenge grant um, and you said staff you know, reached out to them to offer support. And you didn't you didn't hear back from either of them. That's correct. Okay. What was the? Could you just like help me understand the timeline for you know their application came in? How much time did they have to respond? How did you reach out? When we release the application, there are 30 days between the release and the due date of the application. And HCD staff reaches out to anyone that pr that submits a notice of intent to apply. Mm -hmm. We reach out to them by email. We'll call them. And they have 30 days. We have two weeks from start date to midpoint where we are available anytime we can meet with them we can do zoom webex phone calls and then the last two weeks is crunch time we're not quite as available but we make ourselves available so they had 30 days and we reached out more than once to all noi submit okay. submittals uh, for to provide technical assistance and you didn't hear back from either of these organizations at we all did in those 30 days okay thank you you're welcome. You sure? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a pass. I'm, I'm a pass. Thanks, Melinda. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thanks for Thank you. It. You're welcome. Thank you. Good job. All right. Um, uh, noted at the front end of the meeting that we've got a couple of presentations that concern our upcoming budget year and, and really future budget cycles as well. And uh, the first of those is uh, going to be about the financial status of transit. So Ryan Sulchenberger, our transit director, is going to present to us about that. Um, we've got some decisions to make uh, that probably are going to impact the operability of the system for many years.
take it home. Same. Hey, yeah, all right. Apologies for the delay. Ryan, thanks. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk about transit funding. Admittedly, it's not the most exciting part about transit planning or transit systems, but it's obviously pretty foundational. I do want to acknowledge a couple of team members who are here tonight. Rachel Hopkins, our marketing coordinator, and Vic Pope, Longtime transit planner in transit. They're, they're essential to the team. So tonight we're going to walk through the funding process, how it works, how it doesn't work. Um, but the main purpose I want to get across tonight is to explain that all transit funding is reimbursement based. So really what that means is that before any re reimbursements come in, transit must spend the money. Um, but now that the funding mechanism is in place, something I'd really like to do is spark an ongoing conversation about how ACC Transit can expand and can benefit the entire county. And that will allow us to maximize these funding opportunities that are reimbursements. <coughs> so again, everything is a reimbursement, but I really hope to spark com an ongoing conversation about how ACC Transit can benefit the entire county. A little background on the system overview map. Um, every five years, FTA funded transit agencies are required to develop a transit development plan, or a TDP. So in 2018, ACC Transit had finished a transit development plan and this, this system map is from, partially from that transit development plan. Fast forward five years, here we are today, and in June of this year, we will complete the next transit development plan. And that transit development plan will inform how the system may change. It'll, be a, it'll give us a guide on how the system may change and where it may change. And that is something that is shared through the county manager's office and with the commission when it's complete. And so that will be completed in June of this year. So one of the challenges to service changes and to making more frequent service or more reliable service, one of the biggest challenges is recruiting, developing, and training transit team members. That's a big challenge for us here. And one of the unique things about athens Clark County is we have a big competitor for the same type of drivers who we employ next door, and then the Clark County School District also employs the same licensed drivers who we employ. So there's three of us <laughs> working to recruit, develop, and retain the same type of workforce. And that is one of the biggest hurdles that we do face in growing the system. At a high level, this is the transit funding process. And a really important aspect of this is the timing of it all. So as you probably know, the internal budgeting process for athens Clark County government begins December, January, and continues on until the approval in June. Well, the transit team submits a grant application request to the mayor and commission for approval in the fall. Once that's approved, we submit our grant application to GDOT. 
The question mark in the transit funding process there is because we don't know how much GDOT is necessarily going to approve, and we don't know exactly when we're going to get that contract. So when we develop the internal budget at ACC government, um, we may not yet know how much we will actually receive in reimbursements that we're eligible for. What does that mean? We may set a budget that is below what we actually receive. And so that is something to be mindful of. Even though they're all reimbursements, if our budget is set at a level and our reimbursement grant comes back higher, we, we need to be mindful of that so we can adjust the system, adjust our process to maximize those funding opportunities. So the chart on the left shows the decrease and eventual disappearance of general funding and fair revenue for ACC Transit. The funding we're relying on now, again, is 100% reimbursement. Uh, the first of it is TSPLOST. Now TSPLOST is going to serve two purposes. One, TSPLOST is going to provide the local match that we need to provide to the FTA to receive their reimbursements. And that's 50% for operating costs. The 5307 reimbursements will come in to cover 50% of all the expenses. What's remaining from our TSPLOST may be used for matching funds for capital projects or other service expansion activities. Additional funding options can include fair revenue. From an operational perspective, fair revenue doesn't make that big of an impact on the budget, which is not to say it's not important. What it does is decrease the amount of reimbursements we will be eligible for. Because the FTA requires transit agencies to take the revenue they receive from fares and deduct it from their expenses before requesting reimbursements. That's an FTA requirement. And so from, a, from an impact perspective, it actually decreases the reimbursements we may be eligible to receive. Another option for additional funding would be a general fund investment. One benefit of that is it can be very specific for example, a capital project like a transfer station. So the decision could be made one year to say we're going to invest $500,000 as or just as a figure to use in transit and transit would use that to apply for a grant. Now on the capital side, the grants are 80%. So that 500,000 would then allow for 2 million in reimbursements to complete the project of 2.5 million. And that's just an example using easy numbers to, to talk about it. So those are some additional funding options um, that we can consider going forward. Right now, our funding is 100% TSPLOST and 5307 reimbursements from the FTA. Here's some more specifics, and these are projections. And I don't want to read the table to you, but just to go through so everybody knows what we're looking at. The funding projections, fiscal years 24 through um, 28, the, the red numbers at the top are estimated operating expenses. TSPLOST is projected at those numbers on the second line down. 5307 operating assistance in the yellow and total estimated funding at the bottom. Okay, and again, I'll probably say this several more times. These values have no cash value up front. These are all, these are all reimbursements, and that's how that, funding, uh, that, that's how that funding mechanism works through the FTA. Now, there may be some risk in projecting these out. You never, it, the, the amounts may be variable year after year. Um, and so there is that risk in there, but there is risk in any projection uh, for, for finances. So that's, that's how we're projecting our funding now from 24 through 29. So again, we're working through the end of uh, this cycle for the transit development plan. Once we complete that, get all the public feedback, which public feedback has been really, really good. And we've received over 500 completed surveys, and these surveys each had more than 10 questions on them, so we have a lot of feedback, and we're 
pulling it all together, and that's something that we will absolutely share um, once we have it complete and pulled together. Um, but these are some ideas about identifying where people need, where people say they want transportation, where it's needed, where it isn't. Um, you know, we can establish and build transfer points and think about different types of routing and scheduling that the system may not have used um, in the recent past. This slide is pretty fun. These are just some of the comments that were pulled out of um, the surveys that we had sent out and the surveys people had completed. But I think, you know, not surprisingly, a lot of people said more frequent service and expanded service. I mean, that was a big request. You know, a lot of the buses run at 60 minute intervals. A lot of people would like more frequency in that, and that's not surprising. So this one's, okay, this one's really in the weeds a little bit, and this is our relationship with the UGA transit system, which has benefits for both of us. Um, in the past, we've developed, or we, we have, we have uh, written agreements with UGA to share resources um, based on ridership. In 2014, just as a little history, um, UGA received a fair discount from $1.75 to $1.42 for UGA staff, students, and faculty. Um, in 2015, the idea of, hey, ridership is important, and it looks like athens Clark County Transit receives uh, reimbursements because of the increased ridership from UGA. Um, and so that was added on top of the fair discount uh, after 2014 and through 2019. Now, obviously, in 2020, going zero fare, this no longer applied. We switched the model. That's why it only goes through 2019. But there's no way to differentiate between the different types of reimbursements that are received from the FTA. GDOT can't, re can't differentiate them, FTA can't, and internally here we can't either. They're all reimbursements for expenses through the 5307 program. Okay. Again, like I said, I think there are some real benefits to having uh, two transit systems in one geographic area. Um, especially since we focus our service area is about 40 square miles, UGA service area is about 8 to 10 square miles, and so they're heavily focused, obviously, where they need to be and where, where their riders are. Um, but there are ways we can work together. We can design a system together. We can build routes together. We can uh, set up quick transfer points where bringing people who, students who live outside of downtown, bringing them in, uh, getting on a UGA bus at a transfer point, and coming back to the, to, to, you know, into the UGA uh, area. Um, but I think there are some significant benefits and I think it's important rather than focusing on fair discounts or uh, shared resources financially, how can we share systems? How can we build a better system that, that benefits everybody? So the next steps really are, you know, we talked about completing the transit development plan uh, but really, I think we need to get back to focusing a bit on the transit fundamentals and use what the TDP says, you know, kind of informs us about. We need to recruit, develop, and retain staff. A growing transit system needs a succession plan in place, needs to make sure we can continue to grow. And we need to maximize our funding opportunities. And really, the only way to maximize those opportunities, which again, our reimbursements, are to grow the system. So with that, Open up to questions, comments. Avita? I, uh, I think my question is going to be for Manager uh, Williams. T Splos is really the first um, era of T Splos was in 2018. So, how was our system funded prior to, to five years ago? Well, there was some question at 2018 about whether or not those transit operations could be funded with those SPLOS funds, which are traditionally, you know, bricks and mortar. But the state, I think, took a different tack with that. So it really became, uh, in, in, with the 2023 SPLOS, the first time, T-SPLOS, that we advanced that and the Citizens Oversight Committee agreed and the Mayor and Commission agreed and the voters agreed. So what do we do before... Um, oh. Yeah, before T-SPLOS, mm -hmm. thank you, sorry I didn't understand the question. So before the fares, you know, 2019 and earlier, 
we used to try and shoot for a third, a third, and a third, right? So a third from fares, <coughs> a third from the federal government, and a third from the general fund transfer. That's what I needed. And two things happened shortly after 2019. Um, the fares went away, and then we went like whole hog on CARES Act funding, which now is ARPA funding. So the reason that we've had such a general fund nosedive here is because there's been these federal funds that have come through that we've used to sort of balance the books. And now you have TSPLOS as well. Um, because of the timing of this uh, GDOT grant coming in late, we had to burn through some working capital uh, to basically zero out the, the excess funds that we had. And remember, as Ryan said, the state fed funds are a reimbursement only, so we can't like refill the coffers. And so we have zero tolerance for, so this can't, we can't sustain this is really the, the point. Um, we're gonna have to do something different, but t has really helped. It stands in the gap, but there's no fares. And as you can see, the federal reimbursements are kind of declining over time. Sorry, you didn't ask for all that. Yes, I did. Dexter. <laughs> okay. I got several questions, right? Um, sure. So our funding from GDOT, um, I guess it's sort of inconsistent for what we're going to get from year to year. We tend to don't know what we're going to get from them from year to year. Yes, Commissioner, that's much. correct. That is, right. that is correct. It's, you know, the, the, the rule of thumb is 50% reimbursement for eligible expenses. So if something is eligible and it costs us $1, the reimbursement could be up to 50 cents. Um, but it is variable from year to year. In fact, uh, I think it was uh, last year, the 5307 funding from the FTA uh, was at 1.295 million. And two years earlier, it was at 3.5 million. So very much variable. Okay. Um, I want to follow some of what Manager Williams said about we can't sustain the way we're going. And I think I heard you say if we start charging fair again, it could possibly impact? It can um, impact some of the reimbursements. However, the f so the risk involved in using the reimbursement model is if for some reason those reimbursements don't come in and there's no backup. At the very least, Fair revenue, although it would decrease the amount of reimbursements we would be eligible to receive, it is flexible funding. It would be there for the transit system to fill any gaps. And, you know, the same, same can be said for general funding. And I don't want to put you on the spot, but nope. would you recommend that we start back charging a fare? Well, I think there are a lot of angles to the question okay. of fair revenue. One of them is finance, financial. There are other questions about riderships, ridership and mm -hmm. who that would impact and who it would not impact. Right. And so um, when I talked about it earlier and I said from an operational perspective, the impact isn't a huge impact, but the conversation goes, a lot farther now because we are zero fare than just about finance, I think. Obviously, finance budget is important, but I think the conversation is much, much deeper than whether it is. So I, if I were to answer your question, I would say I think it's a bigger conversation to get, get to a recommendation. Okay. Thank you. I got two more questions and I'm yeah. done. Um, the apartment buses, you know, you got different apartment complex. They provide ridership to those students. Um, and again, I'm just thinking outside the box. Any conversations ever with those complexes about how, you know, you talk about routes. Is there any conversation how we might could work with them on routes? I'm, again, it's something totally out of the box. It may not even be feasible, but any ideas from that perspective? I see a lot of buses from the apartment complexes that are dropping students off downtown on campus so yep commissioner you know those uh, you know it's, uh, those buses they contract those out and um, we already provide we being ACC transit we provide a, a fair amount of service to a lot of the right. apartment complexes around like the Riverbend uh, Riverbend apartments for example just as one example you know we run service out there every 20 minutes and then come back through um, down come back through the campus corridor and so we do provide 
a lot of service to the apartments around. Now the apartments um, who have contracted out service on their own, uh, that's something we can definitely look into um, and see if there's a way we can build. Yeah, because I guess to take that one step further, because they do that, maybe we can use our buses to go other places if they're doing it on a consistent basis. But again, I know that's that can get into the, the weeds a little bit. Something understand. to consider. Yeah. Thank you. And my last question is, um, you meant about finalizing the ACC GOV and the UGA agreement. Where are we on that? And did we ever settle the um, situation we was having with UGA about the funding and stuff like that? Did we ever get that settled yet? So the agreement for this year was to for ACC Transit to provide two buses from mm -hmm. the Health Sciences Campus to the Arch, essentially, down to the Multimodal Transit Center and then back around. And that'd be service about every 30 minutes. Um, going back to our biggest challenge right now and is finding, you know, recruiting, developing, retaining staff. And right now with between ACC Gov Transit, between UGA and the Clark County School District, we, our drivers start at about 7 to 11% less than those other organizations, which makes it very, very difficult to compete for the same workforce. But I do think something like the Health Sciences Campus route is a good solution to working together. I think if they find value in that and we can staff that and run that on a regular basis and it becomes part of our regular schedule, I think it's a good solution. I think it's a good way to solve that problem. It's, if, the, if it's a transit problem, transportation problem, that's something that we can solve. So, and I understand that, but it's a funding piece about the money thing. I'm, I'm just trying to curious. Andrew, we'll well, that. if I yeah. could, so yeah. we have an agreement that they approved. Okay. That agreement said we would run that route. And that agreement was also predicated on the receipt of funds from the state. Within a couple of weeks of receipt of those funds, we're running that route. So everything that we said we would do in the agreement that UGA agreed to, we did. Now, it came later than everybody expected, which was unfortunate. There was no fault of staff. Oh, yeah, that, 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 that would help. But no. Brian, we're running. So we, we, we're, running every, we're running service every 30 minutes as agreed upon. So that, okay. Yep. I'm done. Allison. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for this um, historical flashback for a very complicated topic. And um, um, Manager Williams is very aware of my visual communications um, way that I think, and he and I have been working, I think, round four on just a map for me and District 4. So I'm not going to go through what I want to see to help understand this, but it's basically I'm going to ask about the transit funding source slide that you have here and then go to the next slide see see all the details that are in there it seems to me if the dates of the other one were added to here and we just go out to 25 and go ahead and put in there the different sources because i haven't even seen stick i know you say they're indistinguishable and in federal reimbursements but i think it's important for us to know when the, the stick grant stuff well, Isn't that part of some of our funding formula well, at some point in this time? Commissioner, there's, I understand that question, yeah. and, and all the sources we could, come, we could go to, FTA, GDOT, mm -hmm. internal ACC Gov Finance, mm -hmm. ACC Gov <coughs> Transit staff who've been yeah. here for a while, there's no way to differentiate between those funds. And just to provide a little context of where yeah. that comes from, each year the FTA publishes apportionment tables for all the transit agencies around the country. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is for, for example, 5307 funding. And they right. do publish a stick funding, a stick funding apportionment table. Stick stands for small transit intensive cities. Right. It's for rural areas that have a dense urban core. It helps them um, run service like a bigger city. Uh, and on those apportionment tables, it specifically calls out that these funds are not for budgeting and planning purposes, they're for illustrative purposes only, and at the end of the day, it's entirely up to each state how those funds are dispersed. So when GDOT receives any of those funds from the FDA, they don't come differentiated in that manner. They're put into, well, I would imagine a public transit 
operating assistant fund for GDOT, mm -hmm. and then we work as a subrecipient of GDOT, we work through uh, GDOT to submit our reimbursement requests. So that's the long way of saying is there has been at this point no way to differentiate those funds. Okay, so when we've applied for those, it was my understanding that Blaine, help me with what you and I have talked about. I'm, I think I'm mixing up the terms. When we would apply with UGA for granting, and then the reimbursements came through to us to go back out. So if I could, uh, and y'all correct me. So UGA is not a qualified recipient of those federal funds. And no matter what term those federal funds are coming into and, down here. The, well, so the, it, and like Ryan says, and I've seen the table, so it comes, there might be $5 million apportioned to us. We might get two. Mm -hmm. And it's not explained about the difference. It's just 5307. So in there somewhere, okay. is, somewhere in that is stick. But we don't know I how see. much the either <clears throat> is. Okay. So what we did before we lost fares is, and I was at GDOT with UGA back in 2013, and we struck this deal. We said, well, GDOT... If they're paying us for their ridership, then could we forgive or credit or rebate some mm -hmm. of that, what they owe us, and in effect transfer the money? But we can't hand them a federal dollar, at least not now. I'm sure they're seeking to change that. So when the fare went away, we didn't have a way to reimburse That's right. them. That's right. And so then we tried to find, and, and this was when Pat Hale was the interim, uh, you know, what are some things of value that we can we can't give you a physical dollar but would be the same as you know and in this case this came up after and there were several ideas vetted this at the end both parties said this was the best they used to run this route and now they don't so they're saving the money that we're now running Speaking so that was one way to convey the value without handing them the physical dollar okay all right that does help because the email that you had in your glossary of i was not able to the hand i think the hand gestures help too, and everybody, Ryan does that too. It helps with the explanation. Yeah. Um, but it, uh, it almost, I guess the way these two charts, this one and the one before, they come to the same point in time, and then the projection changes. It just seemed like I, I wanted to also know if some of the funding was changing. So I'll put this in an email, and if there's a new chart that merges out from it, or it could be a phone call that clears it up. But it's, it's confusing to explain, it's confusing to understand, and so. Maybe a good chart of these two will help. And I, and I, I don't disagree you. with you. <laughs> about to I appreciate you um, helping me at that quick point. So one of the things that, that Ryan has offered, and, you know, to go down and talk to GDOT, say, is there a different way, you know, with UGA, how to share the funds that is compliant with the federal regulations? Another idea that, that Ryan brought forth is that, you know, he's been talking to his peers across the state. You know, there are certain cities, and even here in Georgia, that go directly to the feds and get their allocation. So that's an opportunity, and, and perhaps UGA could be a subrecipient for us if, you know, if the federal yeah. government blesses that. And what I have to told UGA every year since we've negotiated this, if you can show me a way for us to share the dollars with you that's compliant, I'm glad to do it. Yeah, not me, but the government, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's that, but the re, the reason why there's not an answer is because you know at, at at least currently now they did get some capital funding through a federal you know uh, and so I, there is some compliance there but we don't know their compliance status they don't tell us those things so we, we're trying to guess on how best to do this but we're willing to go to GDOT we're willing to go to FHWA yeah. and if I may add sure. one short thing onto that is they did receive capital funds to buy buses and at that time, ACC Gov Transit uh, stood up and offered uh, to cover their paratransit um, requirements that the FTA has. And so we have assisted them in many ways um, to be compliant to receive certain funds. Um, and, 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 you know, we, we continue to look for ways to work with them, maybe shared technology. So instead of two bus tracking apps, we have one. I mean, there's, there, there's certainly... You know, there's certainly ways we can work together, and I think, you know, the health science campus route, I think, is a, is a good start, and I think that can provide benefit to not only UGA, but to, to athens Clark County as well. Gotcha. Thank you, and I do appreciate your teamwork that you're doing on yeah. this very complicated two, two equations and then sometimes overlap, yeah, that, that whole thing. I appreciate Jesse, everybody's time. Uh, three 
questions real quick. The first is advertising revenue. This might be a question for Rachel. Thanks for being here. Mm -hmm. um, are, you know, how are we currently generating advertising revenue, and where else could we expand that? I know I've seen ads on the buses. I'm going to let Rachel answer that question. She's <laughs> been managing the advertising for years now. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Um, right now, our advertising revenue all comes from the ads on the buses, and we contract that out, so a portion of it goes to the managing agency, and then we receive that. Some other opportunities are bus stop shelters. We can go a little bit further. I know um, several years ago we expanded what could be wrapped on a bus. So bus stop shelters are a bigger one. And then there's, there's other things, you know, naming rights, and we could go a little bit further. But the logical next step would be shelters. Okay. So I, I guess maybe that like, begs the question, what's keeping us from going further? Uh, we have uh, rules. There's the commission adopted policy policies. from about a decade ago. So if we change our policy, you can generate more revenue. Yes, and there is also okay. um, <laughs> if we change our policy, we could generate more. Okay, revenue. that's that's helpful to know. So I, I will just say thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, I would love for us to change that policy so that we can generate more revenue for a system that I think needs it. Um, I would love to see us achieve so much more and I'm super proud of what's already happening but I, I so yes I, any any recommendations you all have for how we can change our policy to generate more revenue for you sounds like a big win to me um, the second question I had I, I noticed an absence on this list of a transit splost and I'm curious if that's been discussed by anyone yet so I'm seeing a confused face no I here. haven't heard Commissioner I haven't heard any discussion about a transit Splost. So there's an, another type of splost we can leverage as a county called a transit splost. And we can leverage it at the same time we're leveraging all the other splosts. The, of course, this would require us considering whether we'd want to go up by another half a penny or a penny. But if we did, um, we could do it at the same time. It would also require us partnering with another county. My understanding is that county doesn't have to directly neighbor us. So we could, for example, partner with a metro Atlanta county like Gwinnett or whoever um, to run some kind of express route um, and then use a portion of the transit SPLOS to pay for that and the rest to pay for transit. So just thinking through now that we've shifted revenue to SPLOS, if that's maybe an, an avenue to pursue. Um, and, and I can pursue with Attorney Drake kind of what the enabling legislation is currently uh -huh. and, and, and how that could operate, okay. just so that everybody has kind of clear view of that. Okay. Um, but I'm throwing that out there as something that I personally think would be a, a, a cool avenue to pursue, uh, maybe p to potentially do even more with sales tax monies and free up t splost funding at the same time. Um, the, the third uh, question I had is, I guess it's for the um, next slide. Um, so I, I'm a little confused by the characterization that um, I'm hearing that um, the current model for funding is unsustainable and that the way I am reading this table, unless I'm missing something, is we are sustaining it with TSPLOS money, assuming that we continue to get the reimbursements, but the moment TSPLOS runs out, we're in rough shape unless it's wrapped into TSPLOS again. Well, right. so a couple things. So TSPLOS is both, in, this, in the case of transit and transit only, operating and capital. Mm -hmm. So the more that we can supplant uh, the other funding sources, if you will, then the more that we can spend on capital. And remember, one of the things that the commission wanted to do and we recently acquired some property for is to relocate the maintenance facility. So the more that we use t splos on operating, the less there is for capital. Um, also, I think when the t splos passed, I think a lot of folks, and, and of course, <laughs> This changes on a month-to-month -month basis, really, in what we're looking at. Um, at the time, I think there was there was a assumption that not only would we pay for all of our transit, but we'll, we're going to run more routes and more frequent. Uh, but that's not the way it's bearing out uh, when we look at this. So, uh, like most things, there's not one single bullet, uh, silver bullet. It's just going to be several things that might get us over the goal line. So. May I add a real real world recent example? Sure. Yeah. Um, it's fiscal year 23. And we signed the GDOT FY23 grant contract two months ago. So halfway through the year, and there's some heartburn in there thinking, where's this contract? Are we going to get it? When is it coming in? And that variability in the FTA reimbursement contract is 
you know, can create a little heartburn when you're halfway through the fiscal year waiting to submit reimbursements for transit costs that you've already incurred. And so I think um, that's why it's highlighted in yellow, because it's variable. Uh, and, the, and the one other thing I would add, you know, we're talking about moving to transfer facilities at both ends of the county, and you all have heard us talk about that in, in other sessions. Uh, that, that's a total redo of the model of transit. And so if we're going to afford that, that's an increased cost as well. If we're going to get to the edges of the county, if we're going to get to Caterpillar, uh, that's an increased cost that, uh, that we would love to be able to use TSPLOS for. Uh, but at this point, this is current services. And so there's no growth built into these funds. Um, heard. Um, and I, I guess I'll just part with this thought. You know, I, I would love for us to be exploring all the options that are not decreasing the free money we leave on the table by bringing fares back, uh, which has a lot of other effects. And, you know, maybe this is a conversation we'll end up having to have another time soon about, about fares. But if, if you go to our Project 19 TSPLOS page, and we talk about promises made to the voters, the very first slide of the very first link in the presentation, and certainly part of the conversation the whole time, if you watch the TSPLOS committee meetings and thinking about the conversation, was fare free transit. I mean, it says right, on, right in bold on the first slide, this would eliminate reliance on the general fund, reduce local taxpayer burden, and ensure future fare free transit. So in, in my mind, the conversation around whether to reintroduce fare box is more a conversation for a model we might need to transition into after this TSPLOS, but that was very built into the TSPLOS project that we funded. Um, I think we should take that seriously if we're thinking about trying to bring back fares, in addition to all the other arguments around, around fares that I'll save for another time. But thank you. John. So the teach plus, how long was it going to last? How many years is it? Five. Five. Or until the money runs out if, it runs out soon. if, if, we, meet, if we meet the funding amount sooner than it ends. And how, how far are we into that five year? We're right A few here. months. Just start. Okay. Wait. Yeah, and then the seven million that we got from ARPA for um, that you sent the email about blank yes, is that that's for trans specifically for transit, right? That's this. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Right. Yep, that's fiscal year twenty three, Commissioner, and it's um, what is funding this year's transit. It is American Rescue Plan funds, one time funds, and so all of our operating expenses this year are being reimbursed through that. And of course, can't be extended into future fiscal years. Is that correct? So I've submitted. Yes, I've yes, Mr. Mayor, I've submitted the uh, the extension letters to GDOT, and hoping to hear back that those funds can be ex extended forward. And then I don't want to harp on the UGA thing, but we to so the agreement was from April of twenty two to put in service when we received the funds and we put it in in February, so 10 months later. Is there a value, like a certain amount that we're supposed to be reimbursing UGA, like a dollar value per year, how we, how we came up with the bus service? I think, I think the order of magnitude number for that, the value, if you will, that service was around 300,000 or so. Uh, I'm trying to remember. So the estimate we had was 300,000 per bus route, about 300,000. Yeah. So that, that wasn't quite the amount that we figured that they had from the last stick round, but that was the closest defined thing that we could agree on that had some mutual benefit. So if we're doing it 10 months after we started the agreement, then they're not getting the full value. What is there conversation about how we're fixing that? Well, so as Ryan mentioned, he's asking for extensions and, you know, we would, I think, offer that going into the fall too. We want to try and make them whole if we can. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's, that's accurate. And again, um, I'd, I'd say it again from a transportation perspective, if the route makes sense, it's compliant with FTA rules. Does it really matter to me if we're transporting UGA students or other people or everybody? Not, not really. So we can work together with them in this way, um, whatever the, you know, as long as the funding is there and as long as we have the staffing. So, sorry, one more. So we're 11 percent less than the competition for bus drivers. Between seven and 11, yes. Starting, starting <clears throat> page. And so, you, how many open positions do you have for bus drivers? Um, I so right now we have filled 35. <clears throat> 
uh, full-time bus drivers, doesn't include the part-time bus drivers. Um, and right now we have 11 vacant positions. And so based on the service hours we have per year, um, we need uh, at minimum 42 full-time bus drivers. And you're 35? Yes. So I guess how do we raise the bus? We can't provide the services if we're not getting the bus drivers. How do we raise that? That's a bigger question. <laughs> well, that's, that's the same thing that we're having with different, uh, you know, attorneys and others. You know, it's time for us to, to do that. So in the, in the budget, you'll see a proposal for another pay study for the non-public safety folks. But this is an enterprise fund. So does it follow the same regulations or same? Pay and classification system. <clears throat> Yeah, and there will be a number of cases where th there's a general fund employee who's basically the same as an employee who's in an enterprise fund. Yeah. So, you know, a, a front of house person, for example. Can I, can Patrick? I give a recommendation, commendation? You only been here for a year. Going on here. You know, streets and neighborhoods, that's impressive. Mm -hmm. Just want to say that. Appreciate that. I've got a good team backing yeah. me up. Ryan, I just want to close with a couple quick, well, one question, one note for the body. Uh, t talk a little bit about the completion of this version of the transit development plan. What's that timeline look like? June of, uh, June of this year. So that'll be completed June of this year. We have thousands of uh, public feedback comments we're wrapping up right now and categorizing. Um, the report should be available you know, toward the end of May and completed in June. Okay, no, that, that, that's helpful. And, and thinking about the word cloud that was derived from those comments, obviously you saw greater frequency being one of those areas of enormous public interest, which as we passed TSPLOST was an operational hope that I had for the community, particularly as with Josh's note, we're wanting to really stretch out to the edges of the community to the greatest degree rational, certainly far west side to Caterpillar. Um, and I would love to see us, uh, in my time in office, get down to something like a 20-minute headway on those major corridors. You know, when we think about Highway 78 being the spine of the community, or Prince Avenue, or the Athens Tech route. I mean, th those are the kinds of things that do attract new riders. And and really, as we're also thinking about the comprehensive plan update, you know, really emphasize the benefit of that density that we're seeking on those key corridors too. So those things go hand in glove from an operational perspective as a community. So, uh, Tiffany had a question. Yes. Um, just to speak to the, um, the shortage, and I was just um, informed that we, you have to go to Athens Tech to get your um, license to drive the bus. You don't, you don't have to. We do training uh, okay. internally. Um, and again, just it's important um, to keep in mind that the commercial driver's license is, is issued by the Georgia Department of Driver Services, so it's a state license. Um, probably knew that, just wanted to make sure to point that out. But UGA does assist us with training as well. Um, and then we can go to other, um, like in, we can go to between Georgia, and they have a testing facility there for, for CDLs. Um, and I want to make sure it's clear that, you know, human resources internally is helping us out a lot. It's, and I, you know, I need to say thank you to them. Um, Although we're, it's sort of a hit and miss. We take a step forward hiring somebody and maybe lose two people or whatever the case is. I mean, they're working hard to, to really help us staff up. And we, we've made some progress. In the last two months, we've hired four drivers, and um, two of them are, are ready to go with their CDLs. The others are still in training, and we're, we're continuing to recruit. So the, the human resources help has been pretty significant. Do, do we reach out to, like, CCSD? Because a job is a job. And I feel like if we reach our younger people um, early, as far as transit um, with the University of Georgia as well as ACCG, um, to have you know just that thought <coughs> that once I get out of school, instead of going to Caterpillar, I can drive a city bus. I appreciate that question, Commissioner. And going back to human resources, you know they they told us about the, um, and I think probably the staff who've been here a long time um, have. You told us about their, it's like a career path program with the public schools that, that we will get involved with. Um, and I think that is an important um, recruiting avenue for us in the future. Totally agree. 
How old? How old would have to drive it have to be this, for the city as a Clark County? How old? Well, the, the rule for a commercial driver's license is 18. 18. Okay. And I would look back. Does, is that different for 19? 19. Okay. But it can be 18. Yep. Graduates. Jesse. Uh, yeah, the CDL program that I've heard um, the folks at the, transit, the transition center talk about, the diversion center, um, getting off the ground. I know the warden's talked about trying to expand to that. Is that off the ground, and is that an opportunity for us to pipeline talent to? Do you want to, Vic, do you want to, Vic, or? I think that, I'm not sure where they stand, but that's something we've had discussions with. Okay. Um, we work pretty closely with the Diversion Center. And so once they're ready, um, I, I know that we have some criteria about what types of, of infractions are allowed. Uh -huh. But um, but yeah, no, we're open and we've advertised that to their directors. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's right. And that's what's happening with HR. Yes, I, okay. I misheard the question. I'm sorry. Yeah, we, we've met. We've met with their staff and okay. uh, along with HR to kind of put some recruiting rules I, in place. I assumed, I just wanted to yep. make sure. Um, I'm always excited to see how that program evolves and grows. And I guess just real quick while we're here, I feel like if Commissioner Myers was here, she would ask. We have this other uh, TSPOS project for electrifying the fleet. And I saw that we have 56 vehicles in the fleet. Do you know how many are currently hybrid or electric and how many we plan to be at once we get through this T-SPLOS? I don't know the percentage of hybrid vehicles. I can get that information to you through the manager's office. I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, I'd, I'd be interested in that when you can. I yep, don't expect you to have everything off the top of your head, but thank you very much. Yeah. Yep. All right. Ryan, thanks for time. Yep. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I have two great staff. Up. All right. Uh, encore for the evening, Suki Jansen. <laughs> Trash talk. Trash talking. <laughs> Love that hat. Thank you. All right. <coughs> Thank you, sir. I like that sweater, too. I forgot to tell you earlier. I know. <laughs> Sure. Okay. There we go. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, it disappeared from here. But she said she talked to you and said she doesn't need to talk to me. Okay, is that what she said? I feel sorry to care all my stuff is over here. Well, it, you know, <laughs> These two angles are the worst. Yeah. This is the worst. Okay. So you can start shifting. I see the mammoth over here. I've always got to take a meeting off my calendar. Did you just get to do that? Uh, yes. yes. Earlier. Earlier. Yes. Boom. And, and, and it was an 8 a.m. meeting off my calendar as well. And what day of the week would that be? That would have been Thursday. Now that's a free hour. Well, a, a non encumbered hour. Well, I'll be there Thursday afternoon. Yes. I won't be there at the private meeting Thursday morning. Yeah, I, got I wonder if it's switching screens. Because that was our otherwise standard I, I don't know. Yes. Yes. Um, sometimes at work when I'm using our large technical computer, we I mean our large TV, we shift, like we do the dual screen and it shifts over. I know. So what you call it? Yes. Freezing. When I say it's cold, it's cold. Yeah, but it's cold. Yeah, it's dropping from when we came in. It was Is it going to be colder at night? Yeah, you have freeze warning too. So it's worse than what Yeah. Oh, I got it. But to be clear, I'll be up before 
Yeah, you got to clean your own Let's window. Let's talk all right, so you just had a roll. All right. Bring it on in, Suki. All right. Thank you, Transit. Thank you. Thank you, Jansen. Solid waste director. Thank you all. Let's talk about Yes, I am here um, to trash talk with you all um, to, uh, in the night on a trashy topic, a topic that no one really wants in their backyard, um, but we've managed ours out there since the 70s, and minus the early years where we had some issues, I think we've done a pretty darn good job. We being, uh, I have great staff out in the audience tonight that support um, what we do in solid waste. But we're here because um, uh, we are going to need to expand our landfill just into cells that we had already projected. We're just a little bit earlier than we thought we were going to be. We're currently in cell 1A and 1B, which we'll talk about, and we're going to need to build cell 2A and 2B a little sooner, potentially, um, than we thought about. So I'm here to talk about some of the challenges outside of the landfill, some of the solutions, and then a projected timeline. So history, um, we had a major modification to our permit done for phase five in December 2012. That's, it takes years to get your permit modified when you're expanding a landfill. So that started um, back in 2012 for phase five. Phase five is the area in Oglethorpe, which I'll show you on the next page. Um, it's uh, nearly 50 acres of property that we purchased from Oglethorpe County, knowing we were gonna expand into Oglethorpe County. In the fall of 2018, we began construction on phase five. Um, we ended up having to um, use phase three a little bit before phase five was open, and we'll talk about that on the next page. And then um, we started <coughs> disposing um, ultimately into phase five at the end of August 2019. So let me give you a little landfill history here, y'all. Let me see if this will work. All right. Okay. Here we go. Um, and I can't, oh, oh, I really can't see this that well. But right up there is Lexington Road. Um, correct? Yes. Yeah. Oh, my goodness, this is blurred. Okay, right up there is Lexington. So if you were to come into the landfill, um, yep. can't see. It is it Lexington, is right there. North um, is to the, to the right. Do I know? Excuse me. This is probably strange for folks to look at since yes. north is to the right. Yeah. Not to but Lexington right there, um, and if you enter the landfill, we have phase um, four right here. I'm going to go back because I can't see it from there, and I'm going to put glasses on, y'all. Sorry. <laughs> Getting old when you get over 50, I can't see very well anymore. Okay. Yes, um, so if you have, you come into the landfill right there, um, you're going to travel into the landfill proper, um, and I can't see the road, but... Phase four is right here. Phase four is actually uh, our compost facility. We have five phases, one, two, three, and four. Um, we decided not, that are all permitted for a landfill, but phase four we decided to put our compost operation on. Phase one, two, and three aren't officially closed. We don't close them because we actually have a permit to recirculate landfill, uh, leachate, excuse me, to recirculate landfill, recirculate leachate. So we keep one, two, and three open so we can recirculate. Also, if we get, we can gain capacity due to settling. And so we used that capacity before phase five was open in phase three. So if you come into the landfill, you'll see our compost facility is going to be directly on the left. That's phase four. Um, and then you're going to travel. So we're able to zoom in. It's oh, good. The right. Okay, so excellent. Don't worry about that. Okay. Can zoom in. And, and then if you go by right past the compost facility, there's phase uh, mm -hmm. four. Uh, excuse me, phase three. That's exactly where we stopped. We the last place we buried trash in Athens Clark County, um, and that was closed temporarily, not officially closed. Um, it was closed right before we opened phase five. Um, and so, and if you go into the landfill a little bit further, the large area right here, this is existing disposal area one. It is officially closed. Um, so just letting you know a little bit about the property over there. We also have existing um, disposal area. We call it EDA. EDA two, it is officially closed. Those two are the, the oldest portions of the landfill. They're also the unlined portions of the landfill. Those were in operation back in the 70s, um, but they are officially closed and capped. And then we continue to monitor and have corrective actions on e existing disposal area one. 
Um, and then this, what we're talking about now is phase five, right over here, the back portion of our property. That's the piece of property we bought from Oglethorpe County. That's where we're currently burying trash. Um, that right there has about 37 years of total capacity. Um, so that's the total capacity that we have there in phase five. Um, we are at right now in cell 1A and 1B, um, and it actually butts up against phase one right here. This is another part of a landfill, not closed. We recirculate leachate there. It, it can take a little bit more capacity if we were needed to, but we officially don't bury trash there anymore. We are in phase five. So little landfill history there. Also a little landfill history for maybe our new commissioners, except for Commissioner Fisher, because he is an expert at solid waste as well. Um, so but when you're building a landfill, a landfill is no longer a dump. Uh, we don't use that term anymore in the industry. That's a very 70s. Uh, term. In 1990, um, our state adopted the Georgia, Georgia Solid Waste Management Act, and that actually set into motion EPA's RICRA, Resource Recovery, Resource, Recovery, Con Resource Conservation Recovery Act. Um, and that act actually sends information to EPD, or uh, it passed laws, I'm stumbling here tonight, y'all, um, all the laws passed on how to build a landfill properly. And how to build a landfill properly, um, you do build a you dig a hole, um, compact the clay that's in the hole, um, and then after you compact that clay, then you would line it with high-density polyethylene liner, um, which is the same type of plastic that a milk jug's made out of. It's just a lot thicker mill plastic. After that, um, we put a, a geotextile mat, often a cloth mat, to protect that plastic liner, um, and then we put in leachate pipes to collect the garbage juice. That's what leachate is. Um, and then we put clay on top of all that. So there are several liners before you even start depositing trash into a modern sanitary landfill that's defined by RICRA. So all phase one, two, three, remember phase four is a compost pad, Phase one, two, three, and five are all modern sanitary landfills that follow um, RICRA standards. So I just want to make sure you know that existing disposal area one and two were old and did not have these, um, act, the act was not requ required of those two existing disposal areas. <laughs> all right, some of our um, issues with that the landfill don't stem from the landfill. Um, the landfill is an enterprise fund. In solid waste, we have a landfill enterprise fund, a solid waste enterprise fund, then we have several activities that are in the general fund. The landfill inter enterprise fund has historically, though, um, had enough money um, to put all kinds of the wonderful ideas that athens Clark County comes up with. Um, we have lots of ideas when it comes to waste reduction, and I think we're very fortunate we've been able to implement not all, but a lot of those activities. Most of those waste reduction activities at one point or the other have been in the Landfill Enterprise Fund. Starting in 2021, even before that, we knew we were gonna start having some landfill enterprise fund issues and that's mainly because we expanded into a new area so we're going to have more post closure and closure costs that we're going to be on the hook for um, closure costs are when you actually cap a landfill and when i told you on the last slide we use high density polyethylene we do cloth clay leachate pipes we do everything but the pipes on top of a landfill it's essentially when you close a landfill you're entombing that trash for perpetuity or until somebody smarter than all of us comes along mines it for resources and does good things with the stuff that's left behind that's what i'm hoping um, for the younger generations that they come up with better ideas um, than past so we entomb that trash and then it goes into post-closure care, which typically we're on the hook for 30 years. If you have an issue, though, during that 30-year time period, meaning if you have an action that's going to cause corrective action, if you have a breach in the liner, um, and if it's severe enough and you can't fix it, then it'll turn the clock over and the county would be responsible for a longer period of time for those closed landfills. So because we opened phase five, we have more closure and post-closure costs. Um, so that's one reason we wanted to um, start getting some of the um, great programs we had in the Landfill Enterprise Fund out. Um, we also have um, aging infrastructure in athens Clark County. I guess I should start here. Aging infrastructure. At our MRF was built in 1995, y'all. The average lifespan of a MRF, uh, Recovered Material Processing Facility, sorry, we have new uh, commissioners in here. Um, a, 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 we call it a MRF for short, but it's really probably more pronounced a rump, but it's our recycling facility. 
The average age of a recycling facility is 15 years. We're nearly 30 years old, y'all. And everything this year that could break has broken. It, it has been the most challenging year for our facility that we have ever, se ever seen. We've landfilled more this year, year because of the breakages than any past year that I've been with Athens, and I've been here for 18 years. So it has been an unpleasant year. The bright side, the other side, we do have SPLOST funding. Unfortunately, recycling's not sexy anymore, and so our SPLOST funding is in Tier 4. We were hoping for Tier 1 because we knew we had an expiration date at that MRF, and we have exceeded the expiration date at that MRF. Um, so, but we do get tier funding starting next year. We already had our first BLOST meeting um, to start seeing where we can situate a new MRF on the landfill property. Hopefully, that's what the envision was um, for BLOST, was moving our recy current recycling facility out to the landfill to have all our disposal facilities at one location. Um, so we do have that coming in, so that'll be positive for the MRF, but if you get complaints that we have a mountain of cardboard behind the MRF, yes we do. Um, we have been working diligently to get as many things fixed in that facility as possible to get operating appropriately. Right now we're shipping most of our material to a, a third processor in the metro Atlanta area so we can get it recycled. So, um, recycling markets, just when we thought um, we were back online a few months ago, um, the markets tanked. And when I say markets tanked, um, we were getting over, well over $100 for cardboard, which was common through COVID because everybody was buying things at home and shipping in the cardboard. Recycling markets depend on supply and demand. Um, and so if there's not as much demand for that cardboard, we won't get paid for as much because they don't need the supply of our cardboard. So unfortunately, and Really, volatility in the market doesn't bother me. We all know as recyclers um, that we're going to have volatility in the market. And you're going to have years where you are making some money off re recycling and maybe even making enough to cover all your expenses. Other years, you're just not. You're going to actually spend more than you're going to make on recycling. Because the end game of recycling is extending the life of the landfill. Um, and we actually, actually, historically, up until this year, we have been um, receiving about 80 tons of recycling at our facility. And so we're able to get that 80 tons out of our landfill, which is positive, a day, a day. Um, we get 300 tons of, land, of trash at the landfill daily. So just to give you a comparison, 300 tons at the landfill daily, 80 tons at the MRF, at the recycling facility. Um, we have a new MRF operator. So a solution to that is a new MRF operator. We just finished our first, a little over our first year with RDS of Virginia. Um, they are a very innovative company, so we're happy to have them. We finally got the contract signed. It was a little painful. Um, they, it's, it takes about two years, is what we learned, for a contract and a MRF to actually work out all the details in a contract to get it signed. So we do have that signed. The benefit of having RDS is they're using a lot of robotics. So they're going to be sending our, our recyclables, some of it, over to Atlanta to a company known as AMP so we can get it robotically sorted. Just like um, Transit was saying earlier, um, you know, our department relies heavily on CDL drivers as well, but also on folks that don't have CDLs but do work that's sometimes not as appealing um, as other work is. And the recycling facilities, once um, we started emerging from COVID, recycling facilities around the nation were having a real struggle having hand sorting folks in the recycling facilities. So we were happy that we brokered a, a deal with RDS of Virginia because they're doing a lot of automation. Um, that's the future of MRFs. Um, equip equipment, our, our landfill equipment and our MRF equipment um, are both in the landfill enterprise fund. And just like I told you in bullet one, our MRF, everything that could break that's nearly 30 years old has broken this year or last year. Um, and so, and it's in the same budget as our landfill equipment, unfortunately. And so that caused problems because you kind of have to pick and choose what you can fix because landfill equipment is very expensive. For example, our new compactor that we received a year and two months after we ordered it, which is an issue as well, um, cost nearly a million dollars. Um, and we have to have two at a landfill or solid waste. If you only have one piece of equipment or one truck, you have none. You have to have a backup. Um, and specifically at the landfill, in our design and operation plan, we have to have two of everything, um, especially when they're talking about compactors or dozers, which could impact um, our, our daily operations. So we have had to put off 
some purchases which have led to compaction issues um, at, at the landfill as well. And so what I began to tell you, which I should have waited, we started fund migration in FY21, knowing that we were going to have more closure and post-closure costs and that we were having some issues at the landfill with equipment, getting enough money to repair at the MRF and buy new equipment um, at the landfill, we started migrating funds from the enterprise fund to the general fund. We started with KCCB, Keep Athens Clark County Beautiful, is a solid waste program. It was paid for historically um, through uh, the landfill enterprise fund. It was the first fund to get moved over to the general fund. Um, and then the second year, um, FY22, I believe we moved part of the recycling division educators, not the recycling facility, part of the educators over to general fund. Then we had to skip one year of funding because we didn't have the general fund couldn't, didn't have the capacity for um, any more moves from the enterprise fund. This year we're recommending the charm get moved over. So that would mean fully keep athens Clark County beautiful, all the recycling educators, and then all the charm and their staff, hopefully if we can make that work, would go into the general fund and that would leave just the recycling facility and the landfill and the composting operations in the landfill enterprise budget. Um, and so that's what we foresaw this coming um, and that's what we had uh, recommended is getting some of these programs that benefit our whole community into the general fund and not being a burden on the landfill enterprise fund. Um, area disposal tip fees, don't get me started. The average um, price to tip trash in this region is $62 a ton. Does anybody know what our tip fee is? I what is it? I'm not say it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Our tip fee, um, it, yeah, you would, you'd be cheating, Commissioner yeah. Davenport, since you're um, uh, the head of the Solid Waste Advisory Commission. 20, isn't it? 20? We're not that quite that low, thank you. We are $45. Is the minimum, right? yeah, we, 20 is the minimum, yes. Uh, so, but we are at $45 a ton um, out there at the landfill. We did increase last year by $2. That was the first time we had an increase in um, nearly eight years. So, uh, go, go ahead. The region was 60 what? 62 is the, the average. 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 That's the average. We are the lowest in the region at 45. Right. Um, and then the highest in the region is, um, hold on, I think it's Homer. Um, and I have the chart right here. I call all around these to these places. Yes, Banks County, um, which is Homer, Georgia. Uh, it's run by waste management. It's $80 a ton. That's their gate rate. That means if um, you all or myself went up there with a load, they would charge us $80 a ton because they really don't want you all or me up there taking our mom and pop uh, trash to them. They broker deals though. If Suki had her own disposal service and I promised them I'd bring them 1,000 tons a day, they will drop that gate rate from 80 to a lower price. And so they'll have a contract with me to do that. Or, or, or other um, other items that they have to dispose of. You're exactly right. So just to give you, we are the lowest. And why that's important, you all, is um, we get a lot of trash from other areas. Are we supposed to? No. Our landfill's a partnership. That very first page, it says, in conjunction with Oglethorpe County. We... 10 plus years ago, we tried to have a regional landfill. Um, and the unfortunate thing is, once you put dots on a map in a community um, and identify that as OK as far as zoning goes for a landfill, people come out in droves. So if you need public comment, I can put dots on a map for you. And we can have all kinds of public comment on whatever you want. Um, because it brought, literally at the Linden House, we probably had hundreds of people there from the surrounding communities because dots were put, two dots, in every county. We couldn't get it to work for a regional landfill, so Oglethorpe and Athens came to the table. We're only supposed to allow Oglethorpe County and athens Clark County trash. It is near impossible. Um, you know, at, at some days, our staff does the best they can just getting all the trucks in and out of that landfill. We ask for IDs when we have time. If we have traffic all the way out to Le Lexington on, on Saturdays, a lot of times it's all the way out on Lexington. We have to go on the honor system, and people know uh, if you've been there enough, they'll say it's from athens Clark County when indeed it's not. We just had to run off one of the big private haulers. Luckily, we have quarterly reports that are given to us by the private haulers, and they um, recorded only a small amount of commercial customers that no way on earth could have translated the amount of tonnage they were bringing by front-end load trucks. So we, rent, we uh, sent them a very 
strongly worded letter um, stating that they were not to come back with that tonnage from other counties. So hopefully by increasing the tip fee, we have uh, you know recommended uh, a tip fee to you all in this budget packet. We'll actually get athens Clark County and Oglethorpe County trash only. And I say that with a caveat. Some pe folks will still try to get trash into it. And some of our haulers, in their defense, if they have a customer down in Madison County, they're going to swing down there and get that person in Madison County and come and dump all of it. So, but we are uh, proposing an increased tip fee to hopefully um, cover all of our costs. And then also, hope people will go to their own landfills because we're not the cheapest in the region anymore. And what, so that's what's the has new two. fee that you're recommending? We are, we are recommending between 55 and 60 per ton. Why not just, why, why recommend less than the average? Um, we wouldn't want to recommend less than the average. Now, I will say historically there have been some commissioners, um, it, unless we completely, well, let me back up. If, if we didn't need to cover all these costs that we do, um, typically you would have a landfill um, <coughs> enterprise fund that just, the point of an enterprise fund is covering your costs. So historically, we've only had a tip fee that we needed to cover all those costs. Um, we never tried to make excess money off the tip fee. Um, we are to the point that, and we had historically, we had at least one commissioner that it was, uh, he really did not, he really wanted us to sharpen the pencil anytime we suggested a tip fee increase or a collection fee in increase. Um, go ahead, Blaine. Well, if I understood the question, why not get the average of, of the, uh the, the region's uh, tip fees, it's because these different cost centers have to pay each other. So when you see the recommended increase in the tip fee, you're also going to see a corresponding increase mm -hmm. with residential collection because those trash trucks actually pay our landfill, you know, just to keep all those cost centers whole. So thank you, Blaine. Yes, yeah, uh, I, I am one of those. I have to sit in the middle of collections <laughs> division, the landfill division, um, a recycling division that's trying to create no trash. Um, and so, uh, so it's an interesting dynamic in our office. We're often working against each other um, for less trash, more recycling, um, but we need trash to pay our bills. So it's an interesting dynamic. But yes, uh, unfortunately, collection fees will go up. Up as well so we can cover the projected tip fee costs at the landfill so you will see residential tip fees commercial tip fees all um, will in your budget packet have a recommended increase as well and it's not just from the tip fees you all um, trash trucks have gone up 10 to 15 sometimes 20 percent in the last uh, couple years and also for us uh, diesel has actually gone up. Um, hopefully it's stabilized now, um, but so those two expenses too, uh, trucks and diesel, um, have been a lot more in the last couple of years. And I think I spoke to closure and post-closure costs. <clears throat> Getting back to the landfill, I had to set the stage though so you fully understand everything that's been in the landfill enterprise fund and why we're asking for some things to be removed. Um, when we expanded into phase five, um, into where we're at right now, which is cell 1A and 1B, um, our original landfill projections were we would get 8.4 years. So we would have approximately till 2027 to bury trash in cell 1A and 1B. Um, during construction, um, we had rock exposed, a sizable amount of rock. So um, our consultants came back and said, you know what, it looks like we're going to have 6.9 years of capacity because of that rock. But I'm going to tell you one thing, my, our staff at the landfill, y'all are very fortunate to have an awesome staff and often they can get compaction rates beyond, usually at least a year beyond what the projections are. So we still weren't concerned at that moment because we get compaction rates historically always have a year to two years more. So staff still believe we could uh, get to that original capacity. Um, unfortunately, during COVID, um, people started cleaning parts of their house that I'm not sure they knew how much trash they had in, in their homes. It got extremely uh, interesting at the landfill for us in COVID. Um, and then that trend just continued. So over the last couple years, we've seen about a 12% increase in incoming tonnage. Some of that is athens Clark County and Oglethorpe, for sure. And by the way, for inquiring minds, Oglethorpe only really 1% um, 
of what we take in is Oglethorpe County trash. It's a very small amount of trash, but I just wanted to tell you, um, they do contribute. But we've had 12% increase over the last two years. And then with equipment malfunctions at the MRF, um, causing some of our capital investment to be used at the MRF and putting off some of our landfill purchases, it has call, caused us to delay purchases of that very important compactor, but also it's been near impossible to get pieces of our equipment um, from uh, varying sources. Uh, it's taken us, in some cases, <coughs> months to get a small you know, piece of equipment to repair um, some of our larger equipment. So that's been an issue. Um, so uh, it, because compaction um, has not been where it needs to be the last year due to compactor issues, um, really that's probably more important than the rock um, was the compaction issues. And really it's probably the compaction issues are more of uh, a cause for our early fill date. Um, we are projecting a fill date of April 2025. This is a nearly full two years earlier than originally anticipated. This presents overlapping loan debt challenges. We took out a loan back in 2017, 2018, and we thought we had 8.4 years of capacity, or at least in that cell. So we actually spread that loan repayment over the years that we projected to have that capacity. So we could have another loan needing to be take out and it will overlap paying off the first for cell 1A, 1A and 1B, and then start to build um, 2A and 2B. And that's because also it takes a very long time to build a cell from the time you get your permit for it to the time you construct it. Um, so it's gonna take us at least uh, 1.2 years to do that. So you can, and this is all just an estimate, it's based on supply of material. I will tell you last year if I came here we would have probably been in a real pinch because leachate piping and landfill liner has been really hard to come by. Lately we're hearing that it, it the actual production has increased and people aren't having to wait for piping and, and liner anymore. Um, but again this is just one piece of the bigger disposal puzzle, you all. We still have about 37, 38 years of capacity. That was what we originally, you know, we, this fight, phase five wasn't supposed to just last us that 8.9 years. That whole, in, in totality, phase five should last us for about 38 years. And then that would be the last, you know, area out there at the landfill where we're buried trash. And then the idea would be, I won't be here in 38 years, but <laughs> whomever after me will have to figure out how to transfer trash or uh, more than likely we'll be transferring trash to some other landfill, at least some of our trash, or somebody figures out a better way to deal with trash that's also economical. There are lots of better ways to deal with trash. Some of them aren't real economical. And so that's where um, it, 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 you know, is a, a quandary. And so, anyway, that's, I wanted to tell you our woes um, at the landfill and a little bit about how we got there. Again, we got there from having great waste reduction programs all <coughs> stuck in the landfill enterprise fund. Um, we got there um, because we have an aging MRF um, that thankfully will get SPLOS funding starting next year. And we'll get a new MRF to take care of uh, a very, ancient facility over there um, and then we already started the migration from the enterprise fund to the general fund but I would like that continued because what we're asking you all to put in the general fund are activities that our entire community can benefit from and I think they're mighty they're wonderful um, uh, I'm, I'm very partial to our staff in solid waste I love all of our staff and I love uh, all of our programs um, but we could be faced with and staff knows this if we can't make this funding work with looking at some of our programs through a lens of what can we cut so that we can save money because the landfill enterprise fund is a heavily permitted facility it's probably it has more permits than even public utilities. We are we are permitted by the land protection branch, the water protection branch, and the air protection branch. And most of the equipment out there and most of the thing, the operational habits, the operational methods that we use are dictated to us. So we can't deviate from that. Um, so staff knows and we've been looking at what we could do to actually trim the budget and, and cut programs if we need to the to the waste reduction activities that we do. But I'm gonna be coming 
coming back to you all with a complete estimate for cost um, and then a timeline that shored up from the one I gave you. And then we'll be working with the finance department to really look through our budget for the next several years because equipment life cycle is going to be um, challenging for us at the landfill for the next several years. So I hate to end on a not so positive note. I will tell you, um, you know, we still do great work with staff. Staff's still going to do great work, but I had to share some pretty heavy information with you tonight. First of all, you all do a great job. Um, you know how I feel about recycling and the landfill. Um, looking at the charm. So eventually we're going to have to find a site selection somewhere to possible move. We, and we, you know what? Um, I was remiss. Part of that SPLOST um, funding was we have a little over $8 million for a new recycling facility and moving the current charm that houses the teacher reuse store and the tool shed to the old recycling facility out on Hancock. So we get good synergy there. The idea was when staff did, we knew we were gonna lose College Avenue probably eventually. So we had already planned for that in the SPLOST request. Thank you. Jesse. Um, I'll just throw out there that I am very much in favor of increasing the tip fee by quite a bit. I'd actually, in my mind, actually going above the average might be good for discouraging people to come here, but also to encourage people who live here to find places to put their waste other than the landfill. Um, so for what it's worth, I, I'm seeing a couple of folks nod behind the rail, but very much in favor of increasing that tip fee. Um, I'm also curious, we charge like a specific fee for mattresses, I think, is that right? We do. Um, we are there charge. other items that we're considering maybe charging specific fees for that are also posing problems? We have a list of them. I can send it to you, Commissioner Hewell. Um, we have a list of things from propane tanks to paint to mattresses that we charge differently based on typically the end market that we use. Uh -huh. Typically the items we're charging more for, we're actually recycling or reusing. So we're charging what we get charged by the end market. And I will say mattresses, you all, a lot of our community, a lot of our transfer stations around us, and a couple of landfills stop taking mattresses, you all. So we're really concerned. I'm just letting you know in your commission districts, we're concerned we're going to start seeing more mattresses on the side of our roads um, because of the banning. Mattresses are very difficult. They're, they wreak havoc on landfill equipment that has to work in the working face. It literally will, the, the spring ones will um, really, uh, break the undercarriages of our bulldozers um, and then also they like to float back up and I invite the new commissioners you got to come out into the landfill sometime um, Commissioner Hool was uh, and actually when Commissioner Hool came in he got on our equipment started operating some equipment um, so I invite you all to come out and see because unless you see it in action you don't understand how a tire and a mattress can work their way back up to the upper levels, but that's the issue with mattresses. They're very hard to process at a landfill, but yes, we so do charge just, certain things. I was just curious, is there also any proposal to increase fees for any of those particularly um, difficult uh, items? Or is, No, you, we uh, weren't. Um, I will say, Commissioner Hull, we get worried with some of those because if there is a point where some of this material won't make it to the landfill and be on the sides of the roads. Then we're just actually pushing yeah. that cost over to landscape management because they're going to have to pick it up in the right-of-ways um, to get it over to us. So we, without a bulky waste, we don't have an organized bulky waste program in athens Clark County for pickup, um, uh, which we're working on. That can be a future work session. Um, but that would worry me if you bump it up too high on some of, the, on these individual, like mattresses, we're going to be chasing them down on the side of the roads. Patrick, can you do a shameless plug on Tire Amnesty Week, please? Um, <laughs> uh, Tire Amnesty Week, for everybody listening, is the last week of this month, um, and that's where you can bring tires out to the athens Clark County landfill for no cost. And it says we often have a six-tire minimum, quite frankly, I've already told staff, we don't really care how many you bring us. If you had 20 on your a property you just purchased, we would rather have all 20 out at the landfill than chasing 20 tires all over right of ways around Athens. So uh, bring all tires to us the last week of this month. Did I say April? The last week of this month um, is Scrap Tire Amnesty Week out at the landfill for Oglethorpe County and Athens Park County. They can bring tires out there, and we're waiving the $3 per tire fee. All right. Anyone else? Um, All right. 
How, yes. would, how would you propose I um, dispose of my king size mattress that I was gonna break? <laughs> take it to the charm. Oh no, you can take it to the landfill charm. or to the charm. We take it, but and we actually charge the same amount both places: ten dollars per mattress yep. or box spring. And we work with a company, and we work with the Atlanta Furniture Bank. They refurbish those and then resell the mattresses. Uh, weirdly enough, so we're still re reusing your mattress as long as it's not wet or uh, greatly soiled, and it's not a foam mattress. Foam mattresses, they, they don't take. Those have to go in the landfill. So we do take them landfill or charm, and if you don't have somebody that can pick them up, you can call your private hauler, or because uh, you would be in the general service district, I believe, more than likely, in District 3. It's a lot, I don't know how many, I don't think we cover uh, District 3. She's but. just inside the urban services district. Oh, then she, you can call us. Mm -hmm. We can pick it up for a charge. Usually it's $35 to pick it up. Oh, it's $20 when you get there. And then if, 20, you did, if you delivered it, it'd be 20. Correct. So this is still correct. a great deal. Correct. Jesse? Yes. Here we have a lot of short-term crises to work through, but just recognizing that 40 years might lapse quicker than we think, like at what point do we start working on, or do you already have a base level plan around like what our plan is after the landfill is full? Um, not after 37. We're not there yet, but we do have a regional plan where we work with all of our partners, and we actually have goals for the next 10 years, and a lot of those goals um, look at more waste diversion, but waste diversion costs money, so you'll see all of those come before you, Commissioner Houle, with a price tag attached. Composting, for example, is one great way that, and we are woefully behind on composting. We're the only the only city in Georgia that even picks up compost uh, as a municipality. We pick up, you know, businesses and we pick up UGA's compostables, um, and we have the compost facility, but you, I think we're underutilizing it for food scraps. But it, there is a cost when you send a driver and a truck, and you have to have a backup truck. Um, there's a cost attached. So you'll see um, a lot of what you're asking come up over the next five to ten years. But some of them um, are going to have price tags that could be prohibitive for Athens Clark County um, when you're talking about. Once we get the low-hanging fruit and waste reduction, some of the other um, activities you want to do come with a higher price tag. All right, everyone, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. 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 All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, everyone, please have a great night. Thank you.